Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend. Let us head fanfics. Back with amazing fanfiction. This is the fourth part of. What if Deku could alter in copy quirk? Now before starting, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Izuku nervously straightened his cloak, feeling incredibly self-conscious as he stood next to Nana at the head of the war table. It had been two days since his and Momo's conversation with Nana. Izuku still was unpacking all the revelations Nana and Ingen's loosened tongue had dropped on him. But she had given them a ray of hope. Deep in Castle Darthmore was the source of the simulation. If they destroyed it, those trapped in here would be freed. The idea was simple. The execution would be much more difficult. So, that's the long and short of it. Nana finished. A decisive preemptive strike on Blackthorn before can set the hordes of alchemical monsters on Rysteria as he has done before. A thin, tall dark-haired man stepped forwards. The forces required to be focused at this one point. Elvar would be vulnerable to attack. We won't need quantity, General Miras. Nana refuted. Just quality. Miras snorted derisively. How many? To take Darth Moor. You'd need thousands. Twenty, maybe thirty. Nana answered. This isn't a siege, or a battle. This is a stealth operation. Stealth? Lord Nivu inquired. Any previous attempts to employ stealth tactics on Blackthorn have failed dramatically. Yes, like he knew they were coming. Nana agreed, before sighing. My son is a traitor. I had him arrested two days ago. He has admitted to the treachery. Endeavors grunted. And Jen, a traitor, impossible. Hawk leaned over to Mirka. Explains why he's not here, doesn't it? Izuku watched the exchange of a handful of coins. Betting, really, I'm afraid it's true. Nana admitted. Kodo was a traitor for Blackthorn. In return, I was kept alive. The Namu attack on Elvar last month. Lord Hawk inquired. Was that part of the plan? It was not. Nana answered. It was a punishment. Kodo, the former lord in Gen, was to lead Prince Tenra into an ambush on Blackthorn's orders. He refused. Blackthorn intended for you to be killed inside the Namu. Maris mused. Psychological warfare. Blackthorn felt wronged. Blackthorn is highly vindictive, but he believes that my return, although not his intention, has secured Kodo's loyalty. Nana explained. We will use that, lure Blackthorn's forces into a trap and destroy them, simultaneously with the stealth incursion into Darthmoor. This trap, how will it work? Miras questioned. Nana smirked. Simple, you're going to betray me. A cacophony of shouts and refusals sounded. Holding up a hand, Nana closed it, silencing her war council. Blackthorn wishes to rule this kingdom, but he recognizes he cannot take it by brute strength alone. Nana spoke. Kodo spent his time destabilizing Risteria and turning the Interregnum Council against each other. He led Tazanori to his death. The end goal was to place Tenra on the throne. Prince Tenra is firmly against Blackthorn. The boy practically lives to fight him. Lady Murka noted. Blackthorn wishes to merge with Tenra, to make him a vessel for him to rule in. Nana responded. We will stage a civil war here in Elvar. Lord Endeavor, you will be the one to discover in Jen's treachery. You will attack and kill me, believing me another of Blackthorn's alchemical creations. And Gear stared at his queen for a few seconds, before nodding. That is what my most likely course of action would be. This will trigger a cold civil war. Ryuka, Hawk, Genaste and Vash, you will all support Endeavor. Nana explained. While Nivu, Torino, Murka and Kruss will believe Endeavor a usurper to the throne. Hence, it will seem like civil war is likely to erupt in the streets at any second. I assume we use some kind of broad area calming spell to ensure riots do not begin. Nivu hummed thoughtfully. We leak knowledge of this cold war to Blackthorn spies outside the walls and he will send his armies to attack Elvar while he believes us divided and incapable of defending ourselves. Ingenious. I see. To the vote then. General Miras commanded. With little pomp or circumstance a vote was held, the gathered war council casting with fervor. Since Tazanori's death and Ingen's regency they had been forced on the defensive. Ingen had vetoed any offensives against the growing threat of Blackthorn. Queen Naomi, 31 in favor, 6 abstentions and 8 against. Miras recited. The council is in favor of your plan. You may proceed at our leisure. Excellent. The first point of order, the strike force that will be infiltrating Darthmore and destroying the source of Blackthorn's power. Nana spoke. I have chosen for Prince Izhir to lead it. I expect your full cooperation with him. Izuku felt the weight of the room pressing down on him, judging him, assessing his worth. He could tell more than a few had found him lacking. But no one dared to contradict Nana. In these matters they knew her decision was final. Meeting adjourned. General Miras, Lord Nivu, begin the preparations. Nana instructed, as the council started to dissolve. We will meet again in the morning to plan the details of Elvar's defense. Izuku released a sigh of relief as the room emptied, leaving him alone with Nana. Not for the first time in the last few days he wished Momo was beside him. 
but she had awoken in the real world. It was likely Izuku wouldn't see her again for another fortnight. You have two weeks. Gather your team and muster in Lars. I will join you once my death has been faked. Nana spoke. If Momo reappears here, whilst you're gone, would you like me to tell her something for you? Izuku shook his head. No, she knows already. Young love, eh? Nana queried, pinching Izuku's cheek. The green-haired teen instantly flushed bright red. You really are too easy to tease. Nana laughed, before sobering. I'm so proud of you. If I don't make it, tell Toshi I'm proud of him too. Don't talk like that. Izuku chastised. We're all going to make it out of this simulation. Youthful optimism. Try not to lose that, Izukun. Nana said wistly, ruffling his hair for good measure. Three days later, two roads diverged by a crystal blue river. Izuku went north, riding with Tenra, Kacha and Sancho at his back. To the east went Kat, heading home for the first time in three years. With him rode the allies Izuku had gathered in Elvar. Kat's companions, Ai, Mika, Hani, Yurio, members of Kyojinger, Toka, Rikimu, Madri and Mashira. From the Bluecoats, Fumu. The only missing face was that of Minta's counterpart, Miyum, the girl nowhere to be found and no one missing her, like she never existed. Those Izuku had managed to assemble would wait in Lars, where Kat was to add Hokkaido and Denshi to their ranks. Izuku was bound for Windy Harbor, a port town of water and fowl, where he would find the final members of 1A's alternates, Suyu and Koda, Suyuiri and Kuva. And so they traveled, pulling their furs closer around themselves as air grew cold, the skies wetter. Thunder crashed and rain battered against them as they entered Windy Harbor, finding solace in the covered streets, winding their way to the local tavern. Horses stabled. Izuku entered the tavern, Tenra and Kacha on one side, Hisama on the other, Hayaso by taking guard, watching for any sign of trouble. Shedding their sodden furs, they hung them with the others by the fire, reveling as the warmth seeped back into their bones. Izuku approached the bar, using an air-heating charm to dry the hair plastered to his head. Hello, I was wondering if you could tell me where I could find some friends of mine. Izuku greeted, as the girl at the bar turned to face him. Short stature, purple hair, Izuku recognized her instantly. Miyum. Hello, Izuku. Izuku took a seat at the table opposite Minta. Or was it Miyum? He'd sent the others away. Under the guise that he knew Miyum, which he obviously did, and was trying to recruit her. I'm sure you've got a lot of questions. Minta spoke. I'm like Yamomo, I wake up every day. You're one of the other two in here. Izuku murmured. Momo said you were missing. Are you safe? Are you okay? Where are you? Safe, somewhat. Okay, physically yes. Minta answered. As for where I am, the same place as that freaky clone of you, Yokohama, specifically my mother's family mansion, which is currently playing host to the terrifying demon that is all for one. You're with all for one. Izuku questioned rhetorically. That's not good. It's fine. Minda said quickly. He won't hurt me if I play along for now. He even protected me from my mother. Why? Minda took a heavy breath. Because he's my great-great-grandfather. At least, I think it's great-great. It might be great-great-great. Izuku stared back at Minta. Okay, okay. Minta repeated. I'm related to the first demon. Doesn't that freak you out? All for one's identical clone is my dad. Izuku spoke. Minta nodded. Okay, that's much worse. Jeez, I don't feel so bad about my relation to him now. Wait, that means we're related. Yeah, I'm your great-great-uncle if I'm not mistaken. I'm not calling you that. Minta denied. How about cousins? Izuku offered with a shrug. I can live with that. Minta acquiesced. You're probably wondering why I look like this, aren't you? Izuku hesitated, before shrugging. I can guess, everyone here, one thing is different about themselves, one thing they wish was different. Yeah, you're my friend, Minta. Izuku assured. You absolutely have my support. Thanks, Midoriya. Minta replied with a relieved smile, before frowning. I'm waking up. Raising a hand, she watched as it began to fade out of existence. It was good to talk to someone real. Minta admitted. Koda is in the apothecary. Sue works on a fishing boat. I saw them both earlier. Say hi to Yamomo for me. With that, Minta faded away, leaving Izuku alone. Goodbye, Minta. Izuku stood, using summoning to bring his now dry furs to his hand, pulling them on. The Namo attacked them six days after leaving Windy Harbor. Izuku's back slammed into the ground, winding him as his horse bucked him off and fled. Gasping desperately, Izuku watched as a Namu bared down upon him. In his flustered and panicked state Izuku's memory failed him, the magical spells he barely knew slipping through his grasp. How he wished he had his proper quirks, a power he knew he could rely upon. Burning fire blazed from Izuku's palm, the explosion ripping the Namu's head apart, defeating it instantly. Izuku turned his hand over, staring at it in shock. Explosion. I used Kaken's quirk, just for a moment, but Izuku didn't have time to experiment. Clambering to his feet, Izuku drew Hinode, analyzing the battlefield as he did. Twenty-six Namu remained. Judging by the scattered rubble the others had already taken a number of them. 
Hisame and Hayasobai fought back to back, a whirlwind of fire and ice obliterating any Namu that got close, like she had in Lars. Kacha was levitating the Namu up high before dropping them, some even landing on the other Namu. Tenra was a blur, Yuik in hand, leaving a trail of decapitated Namu in his wake. Looking to his left Izuku saw their newest additions, fighting in unison. With a yell that morphed into a roar, Kuva transformed into a massive brown bear, swinging his paw down to crush a Namu. In the blink of an eye, Kuva became a bird, darting past a Namu's fist and looping around back at its face. At the last second Kuva reverted to his human form, his head lacking the rocky crenellation of his real-world self, his fist driven through the Namu's skull. A thin whip of water flicked past Kuva, decapitating the Namu charging at his back. Siuiri recalled her water construct, gathering it around her hand before shooting it at another Namu. Loose clay crumbled to the ground. Thanks for the save, Tsuiri, Kuva declared with a thumbs up. You're welcome, but call me Iri. Izuku heard a grunt behind him, turning. And with all the ability daily sword fighting lessons with Tenra had given him, Izuku cleaved the Namu diagonally in two, from navel to shoulder. The upper half of the Namu landed in front of Izuku, finished off with a downwards thrust of Hinot through the skull. Rounding on the next Namu, Izuku reared back his arm, reaching out to explosion. But nothing came. Whatever crack in the lens over his quirks he'd made before was now repaired, as seemingly impenetrable as before. Quashing the disappointment, Izuku changed tactics, quickly casting one of Mika's spells as his palm brushed the Namu's beak. The appendage hissed and seared, the burn spreading to the rest of the Namu's head in a matter of seconds, the clay dissolving away under Izuku's corrosive touch. The number of Namu had thinned out considerably now, leaving only a few stranglers, two of them charging at Izuku in desperation. Preparing himself, Izuku raised Hinode, charging one for all in Yurio's laser magic into the blade. Photonic smash, Izuku yelled, slicing the two Namu across the chest. The beast stumbled back, looking down at the glowing line carved into their torso. Slowly at first the line began to shine brighter, until light beams of every color of the rainbow erupted from it, vaporizing the Namu. And with that, the final Namu had fallen. Izuku breathed a sigh of relief. Izuru, turning, Izuku saw the others looking at him in shock and horror. Glancing down he saw why, a claw mark in his size, blood oozing from it. Oh, Izuku frowned. I thought something like that would hurt more. Pitching forwards, Izuku hit the ground, losing consciousness instantly. I am so proud of you. So would your father be if he was here now. Wake up soon. Please, mom, Deku, wake the fuck up. Kaken, Midoriya, I don't deserve this quirk, so wake up, and I can return it to you. Ida. Chapter 38 The Hero Who Time Forgot Adrian placed his hand over his temples, trying to quell the rising headache. It had been almost two months since what was now being called the Battle of Sarander. Momo, she was reading to him, from the 8th Risteria book. I failed you, Midoriya. Mr. Aizawa. Izuku, take as long as you need. I'll be right here for you when you wake up. All might, no. Dad. Awareness slowly returned to Izuku, his eyes fluttering open to reveal he was lying in a large, plush bed. Moving his attention to the rest of the room Izuku quickly surmised he was in some kind of inn. Memories returning to him. Izuku scrambled to pull back the covers and peel back the bandages wound around his bare torso. A thin laceration trailed along his side, from his hip up to the third rib, smaller, jagged scars littered around it. Running his finger across the misshapen skin, Izuku felt the traces of magic upon it. Kacha's first aid spells, more advanced medical magic from an unknown caster and then Tenra, a spell to accelerate his healing. Morning, Izuku. Yelping with surprise, Izuku pulled the covers over himself and looked for the source of the voice. A dark-haired woman sat in an armchair by the fireplace, illuminating her olive skin and shoulder-length curls. My name's M. Midoriya. Izuku stuttered out, his cheeks burning as he remembered he wasn't wearing a shirt. Right, the world you're from prefers surnames. It's custom, Izuku replied, especially with strangers and informal situations. We're not strangers and I wouldn't call this formal, the woman replied. Remember me, just a ghost in the machine. You're the robot woman, Izuku exclaimed. I'm only part robot, the woman refuted, holding up her right hand to reveal it was made of metal. Name's Ruck, just Ruck. Nana said you were a glitch in the simulation. Izuku breathed, staring at Ruck's hand. The technology looked beyond even the real world. I assure you I'm very real, realer than you in fact. Realer isn't a word, Izuku noted. Ruck waved her hand. Semantics, the point is I'm flesh and blood, mostly, while you're ones and zeros right now. This is a simulation, how can you be real? That power the faceless weirdo has creates the simulation and then projects it into a 3D plane. Ruck explained, reality is subjective. This world may be a bit simplistic but in effect it's the same as any other quote-unquote real world. Simulated reality theory. 
Izuku murmured. Spot on, I simplified it a bit, but that's the gist of it. Ruck commended. See, for a world hopper like myself there is effectively no difference between a real world and a simulated world, so long as the simulation isn't obviously awful. Why are you here? Izuku queried. Ruck shrugged. This world, just passing through, here specifically, healing you, with magic. Yep, my own magic, not this world's. Ruck answered. Mine isn't bound to one reality, works no matter what world I'm in. That's why the residue it left feels so much different. Izuku mused. Could you teach me? Ruck hesitated. My magic isn't something you can teach. It isn't powered by any world or reality. It's powered by grief and loss. Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks. Ruck replied, seemingly on instinct. I also have a big mage I tech sword but that's in the shop right now. Izuku frowned, unsure if she was being honest or just joking. He wasn't certain which one would be weirder. Ruck pushed herself to her feet, firelight catching the mechanical prosthetic where her right arm should be, meeting flesh at her collarbone. I should be going. Wait. Izuku scrambled to his feet. I have so many more questions about this world. I know. Just remember, this world is realer than you know. All it needs is a spark. Ruck snapped her fingers. Your friends left some armor for you, said you'd know where to meet them. With that Ruck left the bedroom. Izuku rushed after and into the hallway. It was empty. Sighing, Izuku moved back into the bedroom, finding the armor Ruck had described. It was lightweight metal scale armor, painted a forest green, reminding Izuku somewhat of Ai's draconic form. Without hesitation, Izuku pulled his new armor on, hissing as he pulled his wound, before securing Hinode to his waist, the weight comforting him. It was odd how quickly he'd gotten used to the weapon. Perhaps it was because it was a part of Izuku in a manner of speaking. The armor was snug and felt protective, reminding him of how his hero costume had felt the first, and only, time he had put it on. Leaving the bedroom, Izuku moved into the main area of the tavern. It was empty, with not a stool or tankard out of place. That immediately put Izuku on edge. Considering the dusk light coming through the windows this tavern should have been heaving with patrons. Exiting the tavern, Izuku halted. He was in Lars. Looking up, Izuku saw the sign of the bellowing walrus swinging in the late summer breeze. A familiar, oppressive air hung over the town. Izuku had seen it in every town for the last couple of days before his injury. The news of Queen Naomi's death had come almost as soon as that of her return. No one dawdled in the street too long, regarding their neighbors with suspicion, wondering with whom they sided. He hated being part of harboring this distrust and discontent, but hopefully it would trick Blackthorn into sending the majority of his Namu into a trap. Izuku made his way towards his home, glancing into his empty classroom as he was passing. Unlike the other cottages, Izur's childhood home was teeming with a sense of life and excitement. The door swung open, revealing Ai, dressed in same armor as Izuku, his a burnished red, matching his dragon form. Prince Izur, Ai cheered, practically tackling Izuku in a hug as he approached. Oi, Izur. Izuku turned to see Cat in the doorway. Dressed in similar armor to Ai, the metal painted a deep copper color. Took you long enough to get here. Cat growled. Come on. Izuku ducked inside Izur's childhood home. Cat in front and Ai following him. From what Izuku could tell he had arrived in the middle of mealtime. The kitchen a hive of activity with Rikamu and Yurio preparing desserts and a cheese platter respectively. Following Cat and Ai, Izuku passed through Izur's home and into the garden. Here was the table normally found in the kitchen, laden with food. While the garden was crowded, newly erected walls allowed them privacy. Izuku scanned the faces. Inza sat at the end of the table. Beside her was Nana, in purple armor. Seeing the two of them together allowed him to see the similarities between them. Further down was Sancho and Momo. Hey. Izuku felt his face forming a goofy grin at her greeting. Hi. Momo and Sancho, like Kat and I, were encased in the same armor, with a different color for both of them, white and ice blue respectively. Also around the table sat Tenra, Kacha and Denshi, each of them wearing their own set of scale armor, navy blue, pink and yellow. The rest of the recruits, just missing those in the kitchen, were also sitting strewn around the garden, each in a black set of the scale armor. Lastly, Izuku's eyes fell on an unfamiliar shock of curly red hair, the owner of which had their back to him. They turned. Mikumo, the only alternate Izuku hadn't been able to find in Elvar's census records. Greetings, my name is Miyachi. The white-haired man spoke, older than his real-world self, his equally crimson eyes meeting Izuku's. Ayizur. The green-haired boy held his hand out, his surprise at seeing Mikumo's alternate almost making him say his real name. Miyachi grinned, allowing Izuku to see something he'd never noticed before. Izuku had never realized how little Mikumo smiled until now. Izuku frowned. How did you? I recruited him. Nana spoke, standing as she did. He was one of the other victims of Blackthorn's giant Namu, like me. Miyachi nodded. It was rather disconcerting to wake up and find out hundred of years had passed, my whole family. The white-haired man stopped. A heavy silence fell over the garden. My whole family is gone now, my daughter, I never got to see her grow up. 
Nietzsche's eyes burned with anger and loss. Taking down Blackthorn won't bring them back, but it will stop him inflicting this pain on others. Black smoke drifted off Nietzsche's arms, swirling in the air before fading away. Izuku bowed his head, the guilt hitting him like a freight train. He alternates. No, these people in their own right were fighting alongside them, risking their own lives for a selfish lie. And Izuku wouldn't continue it any longer. I'm not Izure. You could have heard a pin drop before the gathered party exploded into shouts and yelled questions. I'm from another world. I'm just in this world's body. My real name is Izuku Midoriya. The green-haired teen rattled off quickly, finishing with a bow. I'm sorry for deceiving you. Izuku didn't have time to react before a fist was driven into his stomach, knocking the wind out of him. Don't fucking lie. Cat grabbed Izuku and lifted him straight, his eyes ablaze with anger. I'm sorry, I never meant for this to happen. Izuku spoke weakly, not even bothering to fight back. I should have been honest from the start, since I remembered who I am. Take it back. Cat roared, punching Izuku again as the others rushed to stop him. Bring him back. Izuku slumped like a puppet with his strings cut as Cat was hauled away from him. I can't. Izuku uttered. I wish I could. I took Izur's body, his life, his memories. I wish I could take it back. Give him back. Cat yelled, I and Hanny stopping him from charging again. Give Izur back. Izuku's eyes fell on Inza, and all he saw in hers was pity. No, she should hate me. It's all my fault. Izuku was a fraud. He didn't deserve any of this. Momo, all might. Yue, one for all. I'm no hero. I'm a villain. I stole Izur's body. I erased him. I deserve no one's pity or kindness or love. I'm just a worthless freak. Maybe Bakugo was right. Take a swan dive off the roof of the building and pray that you'll be born with a quirk in your next life. And then, just as Izuku reached terminal velocity of his downward spiral, the burnt orange of sunset washed over him. Sakura blossoms fluttered past him, landing in his hands. Deku. Izuku looked up, his eyes greeted by the sight of Kaken, dressed in his UA uniform, tie ever missing, standing over him. K. Kaken. Izuku wiped away his tears. The truth is I never hated you because you were quirkless, or that I thought you had all for one. Kaken paused. I hated you because you are better than me, you always were. The breath caught in Izuku's throat. Even back then, with no quirk, you were my hero. Kaken continued. Even when I demeaned you and put you down, you held out your hand to me when I fell. Slowly, Kaken's arm outstretched, his palm out towards Izuku. You look like you need saving. Kaken smiled, the same crooked one Izuku had seen so many times before. That's what my hero name is, a promise, to reach out my hand to those who've fallen. Izuku reached out, taking Kaken's hand in his. That's what you taught me, Izuku Midoriya. Kaken pulled, Izuku rising to his feet. Now, wake up. The lens shattered. Energy blasted in every direction from Izuku, the light obscuring him from view. Izuku, Momo rushed forwards, with Nana only a few steps behind her. His ears were ringing, Izuku blinking rapidly as he slowly came back to reality. A crater had been dug in the garden, half the wall utterly destroyed. Izuku looked down, marveling at the sight of his hands, his own hands. The UA gym jacket fluttered around his shoulders, his shirt t-shirt visible through the open zip. Izuku's quirk space blazed with light, a sky full of stars. One for all. Explosion. Creation. Slingshot. Hyper-regeneration. Quirksmith. They were back. His quirks were back, and the magic was gone. Izuku. Momo dropped to her knees beside him. Are you okay? I'm B. Izuku looked up. I'm fine, those thoughts, they're gone. The dark, intrusive thoughts Izuku hadn't had since he was 13. The same thoughts that pushed him onto that ledge. But these ones now were not his. They belonged to Izur. Izuku rose, turned to gaze through the smoke and dust to where Izur rested on his knees, head bowed. You were me, Izur murmured, not looking up. I was you. All the hardships you faced, being quirkless, being so alone, yet, you're stronger for it. I've had a perfect life, and you're not broken, not like I am. Izur, you don't need a reason to feel like this. Izuku spoke, reaching out his hand. Everyone needs a hand every now and again. Izur looked up at his alternate's outstretched hand. I can't. I don't deserve it. Within an instant Izur bolted, leaving through the hole in the garden wall. Izuku's arm dropped to his side. Of course you deserve it. Everyone deserves support. Izur sat in his darkened classroom, the familiar surroundings allowing him to slowly ground himself. He hated Izuku. He wished it was because he had taken over his body, or because he assumed his life. But it wasn't because of that. Izur knew his alternate hadn't had any control over that. No, Izur hated him because he'd been through so much worse and yet he wasn't jaded, wasn't disillusioned with the world. He wasn't broken like Izur was. A knock echoed. Izur turned his head to catch sight of Izuku standing in the doorway, a hint of nervousness in his posture. Do you mind if I come in? With a shrug, Izur nodded his head. Thanks, Izuku replied, moving over to lean against the desk, next to Izur. You doubt your worth, don't you? 
Isher didn't answer. I've been there. You're standing on the edge of a cliff and you're not sure that there's a bottom to it. Izuku spoke calmly, playing with his hands as he did. I nearly died. I spent the next two years in therapy. In fact, I still have therapy, even now. Izuku dropped his hands. You have worth, Isher. No one is worthless. How? How do you get up every day and continue on going like you haven't seen the prejudice of society that bubbles just below the surface? All men are not created equal. Izuku stated, as if reciting something he had read before. That was the reality I learned about society at the young age of four. Eight years later I stood on the railings of a bridge, ready to jump. Izuku sighed. Life isn't fair, and it certainly isn't kind. That's the truth I know, but I know I can choose something better. Life is just meaningless. I'm just going through the motions, feeling like I don't fit in anywhere. Izuku responded. You're right. Izuku admitted, surprising his alternate. Life has no meaning. Unless we decide to create our own, our own values and our own purpose in life. But then aren't you just lying to yourself? I'm not an optimist. Izuku said. I choose to be an optimist, so maybe I am lying to myself, but I'll save everyone I can, to save their smiles. That is illogical. Izuku shrugged. Yeah, I know, but it doesn't have to be logical for me to believe in it. Then you'll fail. Izuku stated. Tomorrow, you're going to take a loose collection of 20-odd adventurers, blue coats and royalty against the greatest evil this world has ever known. Yes, that am I Izuku answered. Blackthorn, all for one, they're not gods, no matter how much they think they are. Blackthorn can be beaten, I have to beat them, because I made a promise I don't intend to break. And what if you fail? Izuku questioned. Then we'll fail together. Your sacrifice would be pointless, just more death in a world where the only thing that is guaranteed is death. Izuku stood. No, it wouldn't be pointless. A hero is more than a person, a hero is an idea. And what's the idea? Izuku queried. Izuku smiled. It's okay now, I am here. Izuku had to look away from the pure radiance Izuku seemed to emit. He almost believed him. Almost. No, it's not. Izuku unclipped Hinode from his belt. Take this. No, I can't. Izuku refused. Hinode is your power. It isn't. It doesn't belong to me. I'm not worthy of it. Izuku placed Hinode down on his desk. You don't have to take it, but I can't keep it. Staring down, Izuku turned and trudged towards the door. I'm no hero. The door opened slowly. No, Izuku spoke, before suddenly raising his voice. No, you're wrong, I was there. I've been in your head for months now, you constantly doubt yourself, you have a complete lack of self-worth, just like I did. Izuku stood straighter, his presence suddenly expanding until it filled the room. But you too can become a hero. The dam broke, tears streaming down Izuku's face. Izuku moved forward to comfort his alternate. No, I wish I could believe you, but I can't. Izuku ran, leaving Izuku alone. Izuku sat on the tiled roof of the Lars school, staring down at Hinode, the sheathed blade gripped loosely in his hands. He should be happy. His mind was his own again, his quirks were back, at least, most of them were. But Izuku was hanging on by a thread. Izuku was still stuck in Risteria and a large quantity of his quirks were missing, taken by All for One during his imprisonment. All for One had taken 56 of his quirks, mainly from the largely unused quirks copied from USJ villains. However there were a number of notable quirks now gone. The second zero gravity, wave motion, decay, erasure, black hole, one of his hyper-regeneration quirks, his fused strength, speed and acid quirks, not to mention all the quirks all for one had used him to copy and then take for himself. Altogether the merchant of quirks had taken 82 quirks. I'm going to get those quirks back, Izuku sighed. But there were a few new additions, endurance, red wings and of course quirk dampening, the very quirk that was inhibiting Izuku's quirk use in his real body. At least I can use them here. Now if only I could use Quirksmith's alteration ability, I could undo all for one's changes to Quirk Dampene. Well, that was unexpected. The green-haired teen looked up, watching as Nana floated up and sat on the roof next to him. I wasn't particularly expecting that to happen. Izuku admitted. The words just kind of came vomiting out and then I blew up. Your lens broke. Nana noted. It was pretty explosive when it happened to me as well. I didn't split into two like you did but I guess that's because of that proficiency you cop it. Izuku set off a small crackle of explosions in his palm. My quirks, they're back, and the magic is gone. How did the rest of them take it? Confused. Very confused. Had to explain it in a bit more depth after you went off after Izur. Nana answered. How is he? Hurting. Scared. Lonely. Izuku spoke. I'm worried about him. How he's feeling now. That's how I felt before. Before, before I climbed up on a ledge and got ready to jump, Izuku admitted, I didn't, in the end, and then I ended up slipping and falling anyway. A hero was passing by, I don't know which one, the nurses wouldn't tell me. Nana put an arm around Izuku, pulling him in tight, I'm sorry, there's nothing for you to be sorry about. Izuku denied, it wasn't your fault, it was, I should have been stronger, I should have defeated all for one, it's my fault that I wasn't there for you growing up. That Toshi has one lung and chronic pain. 
I should have been better. No, you didn't injure All Might. You didn't tell those bullies to make my life hell. Izuku stated, you did the right thing. Thanks, kid. Nana smiled, leaning against her grandson. Isn't the whole support thing supposed to be the other way round? Izuku shrugged. Cat left. Ai went with him, Nana said eventually. The rest took it pretty well, especially after Yairaza revealed she was with us. They're going after Izur. The green-haired teen noted. I hope they can get through to him. I couldn't. From what I've seen, if anyone can, it's Cat. Izuku shrugged. Yeah, probably. So, why didn't you say this world isn't real? That they're not real. This world is realer than you think. Izuku echoed. Realer isn't a word. That's what I said. Izuku sighed and leaned back. The ghost in the machine. Ruck, she was the one who healed me. She's a world hopper. But this is a simulation. Nana refuted. Izuku shook his head. Not entirely. We're not ones and zeros in a computer. The quirk all for ones using is projecting the simulation into a solid state. Oh, wow. Nana murmured. I never thought of it like that. No wonder it all feels so real. Izuku nodded. A comfortable silence fell over grandmother and grandson, the two staring up at the night sky. What was Hisashi like? Izuku asked. As a fighter, or I guess, as a hero. First of all, he would absolutely reject that particular label. Nana answered. And really, he was a vigilante at best. It was more like don't ask, don't tell back then. Not explicitly criminalized. Oh, I didn't know that. Most wouldn't. Nana admitted. The commission liked to keep it hush-hush even back then. Actually, Torino started out as a vigilante before I trained him. Torino, Izuku queried. Nana gave him a strange look. Tall, gray hair, propulsion quirk, behaved like a crotchety old man in his twenties. Izuku shook his head. How huh, weird. Nana mused. I'd have thought Toshi would have introduced you to him by now. He can't still be afraid of him, can he? The idea of All Might being afraid of anyone, apart from maybe All for One, seemed ridiculous to Izuku. Least of all a no doubt retired pro hero in his seventies at the youngest. Anyway, where was I? Right, yeah, Hisashi, a lot of what he did was planning how to fight all for one. Nana spoke, and giving me history lessons on one for all, I mean, he was there when it was created. But my father is a clone of all for one. Izuku questioned, not the original, isn't he? Hisashi is a perfect clone, he has all the mind and memory of the original. Nana recited, clearly quoting someone or something. Up until a certain point in time your father is indistinguishable from the original. Izuku nodded dully. I guess never thought of it like that. He did all those things. He is all for one, just in a new body. Nana shook her head. He shares the original's history, but he is not all for one. How? The quirk has always been known as all for one, but the man hasn't. Nana stated. If the full story was known, some would probably want to call your father a hero for the things he did during the early days of quirks. A hero. Your father and brother did not start out on opposite sides. Nana paused. They fought side by side against the government, against their campaign of quirk genocide, for quirk freedom. Quirk genocide. Izuku queried. We've never learned anything about that in my history class. A history class with the curriculum set by the Department of Education? Nana asked rhetorically. They're not going to advertise the fact that the government once tried to wipe out quirks. What happened? Izuku questioned. How did my father, or I suppose the original, you know, turn evil? He became an extremist. He leveled his blame for the government's murder of Quirk on all Quirkless as well. Non aside, Asashi became convinced the only way for the Quirk to be free was if he ruled over the Quirkless. Izuku felt tears leaking down his face, unable to reconcile the image of his loving father with the monster Nana had described. Your father is a better man now, Izuku, he lost his way. Nana assured, those were dark times. Even those who wielded one for all during those days were not the paragons modern heroes are held in comparison to. I thought I was free of this, that my father wasn't a villain, that he never was a villain. Izuku said, wiping away tears. Your father isn't a villain. Nana stated, a villain doesn't fight for anyone but themselves and their own interests. How many? Izuku asked, voice hollow. How many did he kill? 163. Nana answered, I asked him that once, he told me their names, every single one of them. That's not a villain, a villain does not regret. It still doesn't mean he didn't do villainous things. Yes, you're right. Nana replied. But he hasn't been the merchant of quirks in over a hundred years. It's why he worked with us, for atonement. A hundred years ago, when society began to rebuild. Yes, Nana confirmed, smoothing back her hair. That was when he, as a clone, betrayed the original and left him for dead halfway around the world. That's what all for one said happened. But he said it was the 2130 seconds. Izuku noted. He was lying, trying to screw with you no doubt. Why did he suddenly decide to do good? Izuku mused. Nana shrugged. Don't know, he'd never said what the catalyst was. But that was when All for One was born, as a true villain, in the embers of the Third's days. That was when the original took the name All for One, wasn't it? Izuku queried. Nana nodded. All for One laid low at first, 
never rocking the boat, seeping into every pore of the new hero society as it grew. The third user did all for one not kill him. As far as I'm aware, the first user died because of the strain on his already frail body. The second was killed in a three-way fight between him, Hisashi and government forces. Nana paused. The third, after Hisashi betrayed all for one, passed the quirk onto one he considered worthy and left Japan, never to be seen again. The fourth, he was the first to fight all for one then. Izuku straightened up, his eyes no longer crying. Not at first, he spent twenty years in seclusion, training, strengthening one for all in case the merchant of quirks returned. Nana informed, when all for one finally made his move, the fourth rose to fight him, but was no match, and thus the cycle of death began anew. When did Hisashi start helping one for all users? Izuku questioned. Shortly after all for one killed the fifth, Nana finished, before standing and walking over to the edge of the roof. When whistled through the trees, can I ask, why did you give my father the name Hisashi? I guess he just reminded him of my dad. Nana admitted, Hisashi Shimura was a hero as well, one of the first, he had a minor telekinesis quirk, died not long after I graduated from UA. Nana lifted into the air, after I got one for all, your father's power and support was the first time I didn't feel like I was all alone. It was the first time since my dad died, why didn't he have a name before you gave him one? He didn't have one. Nana answered, after he betrayed all for one, some kind of switch activated in him, wiped his memories. He saw the fifth using one for all in a news report years later, jogged enough of his memories that he decided to seek him out. You said the fifth was dead before Hisashi joined the cause. Your father got there just too late. All for one fatally wounded the fifth, but he was able to hold him off long enough for the fifth to pass the quirk to his apprentice, my master. Nana explained, by the last time I saw Hisashi. He'd gotten almost all his memories back, never told me his real name, guess he felt like it didn't fit him anymore. That's as much as I know, Hisashi was always a private person. Izuku nodded, lost in thought. I see, now, you'd better get to bed. We've got a castle to infiltrate tomorrow, and no doubt everyone is going to have twenty questions for you. Nana spoke, sleep well. With that, Nana stepped off the roof and floated down to the ground, leaving Izuku alone under the starry sky, hugging his arms around his legs. Izuku sighed. He'd told them all about him being from another world, but he still felt like it wasn't enough. How could he tell that when All for One was defeated they might all stop existing? They would die, and it would be Izuku's fault. Izuku didn't sleep that night. Breakfast was eaten in silence, scattered around the garden, the early morning light shining down on them. Izuku sat by himself, his back to the now-repaired garden wall. An awkwardness permeated the air. No one wanted to look at the empty chairs. Izur, Cat, I, all gone in the dead of night. And so was Momo. He hadn't had a chance to say goodbye before she'd woken up. Back to the real world. Or rather, another world. The home Izuku was fighting to get back to. Here, you're going to need your strength for today. A bowl of porridge was held out to Izuku. The green-haired teen reached out, taking the bowl from Inza. Thank you. You're very welcome. Inza replied. I'm sorry. Izuku lowered his spoon. I should have told you the truth straight away. I noticed. Inza smiled. I noticed straight away. The same thing happened to Tazanori when he first bonded to the blades. Izuku straightened. Wait. Tazanori had another mind in his body like Izur and I. Not for very long, just a few weeks. Inza answered. The other Tazanori believed he was dreaming, on the edge of death. That must have been when All Might, my version of Tazanori, was in the coma after his injury. Izuku realized. He mentioned an injury back then, an enemy he killed. Inza mused. What was the name he said? Right, that was it, all for one. It didn't stick, unfortunately. Nana commented, as she joined them. Sensing a change in the air, Inza began to move on. I'll leave you two to your conversation. And don't forget to eat up, Izuku. Izuku nodded. I will, thank you. Ha, huh, so Toshi's been here too. Nana sighed. I wonder how far this goes back. Maybe even to the first one for all user. Izuku jumped to his feet. I know what this is now, I know what Risteria is. And, it's linked to one for all. When users are close to death they come here. Izuku explained, but as the words came out of his mouth he could tell he wasn't quite right. But what if it's not that it's linked to, but the first user and when he passed on his quirk the link was passed on as well. All for one created this place as a refuge for his brother during his illness. Nana breathed, and now he's using it to try and usurp our bodies. HM. Izuku nodded, deep in thought. But that still doesn't explain Momo and Minda, plus whoever the fifth person is. You said that this Minda is all for one's descendant and captive. Perhaps this is a way to keep her docile while she is in prison, to grant her wish and keep her distracted. Nana reasoned. As for Yeyurazu, my best theory is that all for one brought her here to give you something real to fight for, someone you'd give your life for. Izuku shrugged. It doesn't matter now, but at least this idea would mean this world will continue on after we leave. What matters now is that we get into Darthmore into the way out. Nana nodded in agreement. 
Well then, are you ready? Hesitating for a moment, Izuku found his resolve. Yeah, I am. Ha, huh, you and Izuku are pretty similar. Fisher bit back a reflective comment, instead continuing to stare down at his feet as they trudged along. Shut up, Cat groused. Izzer's nothing like that dick. He wouldn't fucking lie to us like that. Cat's right and wrong. Izzer spoke softly, stopping suddenly. I'm not like Izuku. I'm a failure. But while we were merged, I was him and he was me. If you want to blame him for not telling you, then you'll have to blame me too. TCH, whatever. Cat dismissed. Course I'm not gonna blame you. He's the fucking interloper. No, he's not. Izzer sighed, speaking under his breath. I am. I'm just a manifestation of his self-doubt, the part of him that died that day on the bridge. I fell, and he rose. Izzer looked up at the morning sky. So please, they all need your help. I don't deserve it. Izuku studied the castle. A loose collection of Namu stood guard outside the main gate, more patrolling the perimeter. Ducking back into cover, he straightened the cheap leather armor strapped on over his UA tracksuit. How the hell are we going to get it? Michi questioned. Yeah, there's no way we're going to be able to destroy those Namu without alerting the whole castle. Kacha added. Nana spoke. That's what we want. One group will rush the Namu on guard, causing a distraction. The other will sneak in during it. Izuku will use variable mist to make some cover for us. We should go in through there. Izuku stated, pointing at the ruined priory outside the castle walls. There's an underground passageway into the main keep there. It's collapsed part way through, but Tenra should be able to fix it with a localized temporal reversion spell. Bika frowned. A what? I'll rewind time on the passageway back to a point when it was intact. Right. Vika nodded. I still don't get it. Tenra's going to fix it with a spell. Hanny summarized. Oh, now it makes sense. Vika uttered, giving a thumbs up. Hakayo, you'll be leading the distraction group. Izuku explained. Mika, Hanny, Yurio, Fumu, Tsuyuiri, Kuva and the Kyojingers will be under her command. The rest of us will be the infiltration team. Everyone clear. A chorus of affirmations greeted him. Nana looked to Hakayo's team. Now, let's get started. Have fun storming the castle. The gathered warriors nodded in agreement. I've always wanted to say that. A sonic wave washed over the Namu, shattering the nearest and rattling the others. Yurio, now. At Hakayo's command, laser beams fired from Yurio's eyes, turning his head to sweep them across the battlefield. Namu lay on the ground, some missing their legs, the others entirely bisected. Now's our chance, while they're still healing. Hani landed in a crouch in front of a one-legged Namu before springing up and delivering a devastating kick to the underside of its jaw. In an instant the Namu exploded, followed by another suddenly dissolving, revealing Mika stood behind. A direwolf leapt clean over Mika, landing on a bisected Namu's prone form and taking its head off with a single snap of his jaws. Transforming back into his human form, Kuva stamped down, crushing the head of another Namu. Fumu sprinted past, creating a shadow step in front of himself to leap from bringing the shadow blades in his hands down to cut a Namu's head in quadrants. A wave of water swelled, pulled from the nearby river, washing over three Namu in freezing solid. Tsuyuiri lowered her hands. Mashira, now. Mashira, enlarged to twice his normal size, charged at the Namu encased in ice, delivering a swift kick to it, the ice and Namu shattering into nothingness. The gates creaked open, and from them poured more Namu, both the regular variant and the larger ones made from the fusion of multiple smaller ones. Kyojinger, you're up. Hakayo commanded. The four soldiers regrouped, each increasing their size until they surpassed the merged Namu, and charged to face them head on. The tunnel was cold, wet and foul smelling, but no one complained. Their minds focused on the task ahead of them. We're here, Izuku stated, as the group halted, the tunnel collapsed in front of them. You'll have to do this alone, Tenra. I don't have access to magic anymore. Tenra hesitated, before nodding. I am not certain I can, but I will try my best. And so will I. The group turned. Izzer gave a weak smile and wave. Behind him stood Cat and I. You came. Izuku spoke with a smile. Izzer nodded. I thought about what you said. That you choose to hope. Well, I've decided I'm going to choose to believe in myself. More like I beat it into him. Cat muttered. Man, I love run for your life. You're the only one who does. I added. Then you're going to be needing this. Izuku unclipped Hinode and held it out. Pausing for a moment, Izzer forced himself to reach out and take it. The instant his finger grasped the blade it lit up, the light spreading up Izzer's arm and into his entire body. I'm worthy of it. Izzer breathed, the relief clear on his face. Let's get on with this. Cat groused, before glaring at Izuku. And by the way, I still don't like you. Some things never change. Izuku muttered, a wry smile on his face. How did you find us? Sancho queried, suspicion etched into his features. What? You fucking questioning us? Cat retorted, like we'd join up with a psycho like Blackthorn. Izzer tentatively raised a hand. That was me actually, this thing, the connection Izuku and I have, it lets me know where he is. The tunnel shook, a sonic cry just about audible, fragments of stone and loose dirt rained down on them. Hakayo must be having fun. 
Denshi noted, glancing up at the ceiling. She only usually gets that high-pitched when we're. Nichi placed his hand over Denshi's mouth. It's probably safer if you don't finish that sentence. Nana spoke. Well then, Tenra, Izhir, if you could repair the tunnel the sooner the better, I'm not sure how much longer it's going to last. The two brothers nodded, stepping forward to the front of the group. So, standard double-casted localized temporal reversion spell. Izhir queried. Or do you think it's going to need something stronger? Tenra tilted his head. That spell will work as a base, but I think we'll need the greater variant. Izuku watched the two of them interact his mind casting back to when he'd done the same process with Tenra to Free Eye. His mind had been brimming with ideas about potential spell modifications and crafting theory, now that was all gone. To say I replaced Izhir is wrong. I didn't usurp him, I merged with him. There, that should work, Tenra stated. Agreed. Izhir took a few steps back. Ready, Tenra nodded. Ultimum Tempest. Recuro. Caverna. The two princes began to glow. The collapsed area shifting as rubble started to rise. Ultimum Tempest. Recuro. Caverna. As soon as the last syllable left their lips the rate at which the tunnel was repairing itself accelerated exponentially. In a few seconds the restoration of the tunnel was complete. The stone looked as if it was freshly chiseled, in stark contrast to the weathered rock outside the area of the spell's effect. Let's move. Hakayo's group won't be able to distract them forever. Nana spoke, leading them onwards. Izuku fell in step with his alternate. I'm glad you came. Me too. Izur answered. The thought of you all dying popped into my head and... And your feet moved before you could think. Izur nodded. It's not a lack of fear. Izuku spoke. But the ability to not let it control you. All might, he said that. Izur rested a hand on Hinod's hilt. I remember it, on the beach, but not much more. Yeah, I only have bits and pieces of your memories too. I guess when we merged it left an imprint of the other. Izuku mused. A metallic clang grabbed their attention. The two green-haired teens turning to see Nana had opened the door at the end of the tunnel. Remember, try to keep quiet, stick to your groups. Nana instructed, the rest of them following her out of the tunnel. Well, 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 what do we have here? Izuku froze, he recognized that voice. Or rather, voices. Izuku turned, standing in front of the group was Overhaul, sans his plague mask, and with white hair and red eyes. Now, it's not very polite to sneak into my home, is it? Blackthorn drawled. Oh shit, he found us. Denshi panicked, fumbling for his sword. Izuku's eyes didn't leave Blackthorn. He knew the only one in Rysteria who had met Overhaul was himself. And Izuku also knew he wasn't so terrified of Overhaul that the fear of him was equal to or stronger than that of all for one. And so Izuku knew. Identity of the fifth person trapped in the simulation. It was a re. Izuku activated one for all in his arms at 5%, illuminating them with red lines and green lightning. Where is she? Blackthorn regarded him with a cold look of disgust. She's here, kept trying to escape so I put her in here. All for one, Nana questioned, moving herself so she shielded the others. In the data, Blackthorn bowed mockingly. For the most part, I copied my mind, merged it with my alternate in this simulation. At least, that was the case before Eri's fear of overhaul was introduced to the system. It changed me, made me stronger. Quite interesting really. This the fucker who's trapped you guys here. Cat growled, looking ready to fire a concussive beam at any moment. Trapped them here. Blackthorn scoffed. I did nothing of the sort, Eri's the only one I brought here, and Miyum of course. I was right then. Risteria is linked to one for all. If the user is in a coma, they come here. Ezuku stated. You've got Nana in a coma. And I'm in a medically induced coma. A fascinating quirk, dreamscape. Blackthorn replied. I sometimes wonder how many more quirks like it would exist if I hadn't killed its original holder after I took it from them. Die. A concussive beam fired at Blackthorn, aimed directly at his chest. Raising a hand, Blackthorn froze it in cat in place. Tut, tut, I was trying to have a conversation. Blackthorn waved his hand dismissively, banishing the attack back at Cat. The blonde teen slammed into the wall, dropping to the stone floor. That's all you've got. Cat growled, moving to stand, only for his hand to phase through the floor. What the hell? Raising his hand, Cat watched with horror as it faded out of existence, the rest of his body following it. You fucking bast. Cat was gone. Cat, I yelled, staring at the empty space in front of him. You spineless bastard. I charged at Blackthorn, triggering his transformation into dragon form as he did. Really, another wave and I was gone as well, reducing their number to eight. Tenra's hands tightened around his sword, but he remained where he was, glaring at Blackthorn. You know what? Blackthorn mused. Let's simplify this a bit more. With a shouted spell, Tenra shot at Blackthorn, swinging you ache as he did. Blackthorn pivoted, avoiding the blade, before clicking his fingers. Tenra, Kacha, Denshi and Sancho all vanished. Yui clattered to the floor. Do you see now? Blackthorn questioned. I am the god of this reality. You mere programs. You alternates. I can banish you with a single thought. Nietzsche roared with rage, sprinting at Blackthorn before jumping into the air with a spin. 
The white hair man rolled his eyes and banished him from existence. But Miichi had expected that, releasing the grip of his sword at the last moment. The sword remained, burying itself in Blackthorn's shoulder. That was pretty clever, Blackthorn admitted, reaching up to the sword, but ultimately pointless. As soon as Blackthorn touched the blade it burst into fragments, his shoulder healing instantly. Overhaul's power. Izuku breathed, dread running through his veins. I'll have to thank Yuri for it. Blackthorn chuckled, throwing his head back. Nana acted, floating into the air. Nana waited until she was above Blackthorn to deactivate her quirk, delivering an axe kick to the top of his head. Nice try. Blackthorn mocked, catching her foot just before it made impact. My turn. Spinning around, Blackthorn launched Nana with a massive burst of strength, sending her through the wall of the corridor. Izuku gritted his teeth. I have to fight fire with fire. This poured from his mouth, filling up the enclosed space, or in this case overhaul, activating his copy of the quirk. Izuku dashed forwards, sliding under Blackthorn's wild punch and brushing his fingertips against the floor. It broke apart, Blackthorn falling through the newly formed hole, followed by a boulder formed from the material Izuku had deconstructed, aiming his right hand into the hole in the floor. Izuku tapped into half hot half cold, creating the largest block of ice he could manage around Blackthorn's prone form. Nana clambered through the destroyed wall, her armor worse for wear. That won't hold him, but he's not as strong as All for One, just a watered-down copy mixed with his alternate. Yeah, All for One doesn't make perfect copies, he learned that mistake with Hisashi. Izuku added, using a brief burst of Todoroki's fire to thaw the ice on the right side of his body. The entire floor gave way, destroyed by Blackthorn's overhaul. Instinctively, Nana used her quirk, slowing her descent, Izuku copying her with the use of slingshot. Izuru instead decided to go down swinging wielding Hinode wildly as he fell. A suppressed cry of pain told them that he had struck his mark. The mist cleared, revealing Blackthorn holding his injured arm, a small cut running diagonally across it. Not bad, Blackthorn commented, but you heroes are always reticent to press the advantage. Reeling his arm back, Blackthorn activated a number of quirks, the limb doubling in size. Air cannon, force multiplier, power. In the moment before Blackthorn released his attack, the three one for all users desperately prepared themselves. Izur dug Hinode into the floor, gripping it tightly. Nana floated up towards the missing ceiling, hoping to avoid it, while Izuku used slingshot to form a shield of rubble. The massive cyclone of wind crashed upon them, overpowering Izur's grip and sending him flying backwards, crashing into Nana moments before she got out of his path. Eventually, the winds died back, the rubble shield in front of Izuku collapsing back to the floor, while Nana and Izur rolled to a stop further down the corridor. Blackthorn strode forwards. Nice try. A backhand smashed Izuku into the wall, before slamming down on the floor as it collapsed on top of him. Izuku reached desperately, able to see out of a small gap as Blackthorn sauntered towards the others. Picking Nana up by her neck, Blackthorn drove his fist into her stomach and tossed her aside. You had promise. Blackthorn looked down at the prone Izur. That caution, the need for safety, I could have used that. Instead, that oaf of an alternate corrupted you, infected you with that disgusting hero virus. He didn't infect me. Izur coughed forcing himself to his knees. He showed me the courage I had all along. Izur, no. Izuku cried, desperately trying to free himself. Forming an ice dagger, Izur launched himself to his feet, aiming it at Blackthorn's throat. It never made it. Izur was gone. And then there were two. No, Izuku roared, charging up to 10% as he tried and failed to lift the rubble that buried him. His muscles screamed in protest, burning and tearing as one for all ripped through them. The rubble suddenly vanished, Izuku stumbling forwards onto all fours. Raising his head, Izuku glared at Blackthorn, before launching himself at him. Izuku didn't even think to limit one for all, pouring his anger and frustration into his fist. Smash! With a look of boredom, Blackthorn stood and watched as Izuku's fist impacted into his chest. The villain's skin rippled as it absorbed the blow before reflecting it back on its source. Izuku slammed into the wall, deep cracks spiraling out from the point of contact. Impact recoil. Blackthorn stated, You could be God, you know that right. Heroism is a disease that corrupts people with quirks like ours, limits them. I alone stand unaffected. Izuku forced himself to his feet. You're not a god, you're just a pale copy, the real all for one isn't here. Charging one for all and super stretch into his legs, Izuku leapt into the air, spinning as he passed over the top of Blackthorn. Electrification. He discharged digits, parallel circuit, finger of Thor, summoning the full power of one for all into his fingertip. Izuku flicked a massive gust of wind and a bolt of lightning straight towards Blackthorn's back. A wall sprung up, cracking and buckling under the weight of Izuku's attack, but protecting Blackthorn successfully. Have you forgotten? 
Blackthorn mocked. I control this world. Its very reality is mine to command. Waving his hand, Izuku watched as the corridors around him shifted, the walls repairing themselves, creating a labyrinth. I made this world. I can erase it too. Blackthorn spoke, clicking his fingers. I'd say you have about half an hour before this world is completely gone. If you don't get out before then, you'll be trapped here forever and your body becomes mine. So that's why you're doing this. Izuku grunted. You trap me here and all for one lets you escape the simulation in the clone body. Blackthorn nodded. Now you're getting it. Izuku laughed, bowing his head. You're an idiot if you think all for one will hand a body with one for all in it to you. He's playing you, you're just another pawn on his chessboard. And what does that make you? Izuku's expression hardened. The magician, staring at his opponent in confusion, Blackthorn spoke. You don't know how to play chess, do you? Izuku didn't answer. Fine, have it your way. Eri, where is she? Izuku questioned, the hardness creeping into his voice. Blackthorn pointed down. In this castle, or rather, maze, you stand a chance of escaping if you look for the portal straight away. But if you go for her instead, well, I hope you've made your peace. With a final mocking smirk Blackthorn vanished, leaving Izuku alone in the corridor. Rushing over to the unconscious Nana, Izuku activated heel, linking into one for all, pressing his finger pads to the side of her head. Her broken leg straightened, the gash over her eye healing. Nana returned to consciousness the moment he finished. Where is he? Nana demanded, trying to stand but stumbling when she tried to use her formerly broken leg. Blackthorn's gone, I don't know where. Izuku admitted, help her stand. Where's Izur? Izuku bowed his head. Banished, Blackthorn erased him. What the hell? Nana breathed, looking out the nearest window. Izuku turned his head to follow her line of sight. A white void in the distance, slowly consuming the landscape and creeping towards them. Blackthorn's ending the simulation. We've got about 25 minutes to get out of here. Izuku explained. Right, he shifted the corridors but I know the portal's three stories up. Not amused. We should just punch through the ceiling, that should save some time. Izuku charged one for all into his arm at 10%, dampening the recoil with shock absorption and super stretch. His fist impacted the ceiling. A red text box opened. Immortal object. Nana sighed. Great. He's made the castle indestructible. We'll have to go the long way round. You go, find the portal. Izuku stated, holding his hand out as he created an earpiece in the palm. Take this. Nana slotted the device into her ear. What about you? Here he is in the dungeons. I promised I'd save her. Izuku spoke, fire in his voice and every action. Retrieving Hinode from where it was driven into the floor, attaching it to his belt. I'll let you know when I find the portal. Izuku nodded. There's a tracker in the earpiece. Don't wait for me. Go through it as soon as you can. Nana hesitated. Promise me you won't wait. Izuku pleaded. The less chance we give Blackthorn the better the outcome. Slowly, Nana nodded. The unease and worry etched into her face. Good luck. Izuku gave a small smile. Stay safe. Nana reminded. And if you get attacked, tell me. Izuku nodded. Before turning and heading down the nearest set of stairs. Please be safe, Izuku. Nana whispered. Two floors down Izuku trudged on. All he'd come across so far were a few stray Namu. No match for him now he had overhaul. Muffled crying reached Izuku's ear. Stopping, Izuku looked around himself, his eyes quickly landing on a heavy oak door, slightly ajar. Activating rock hard, Izuku turned his hands and forearms into diamond, creeping towards the door. Well aware it could be a trap, Izuku pushed it open with slingshot. A darkened stairway, leading downwards. With no other options, Izuku descended into the shadows. After a few seconds Izuku stepped into the light. Finding himself in a long, thin corridor, cells running down his right side. Anamu roared, charging at Izuku. Half hot half cold. Izuku slammed his right foot down, ice blossoming out and encasing the Namu entirely. Wind generation. A cyclone formed around Izuku's arm, spiraling out and shattering the Namu into specks of ice, blown away on a breeze. A whimper, releasing his quirks, Izuku crept forwards, pushing open the door of every cell as he passed until one wouldn't budge. It was locked, with no key in sight. Izuku could destroy the door with ease. He could smash it, melt it, rip it off its hinges, turn it into water, decay it, just to name a few. And all those would just make Uri more scared. So instead, it was time for the subtle approach. Activating slingshot, Izuku used the strands to feel around the workings of the lock until he felt and heard a definite click. The door opened slightly of its own accord, the hinges squeaking as it did. Another whimper, more fearful this time. Izuku stared at his warped reflection as the door opened, trying to replicate the warming smile he'd seen on All Might so many times. It was a little grim, but Izuku wasn't unsatisfied with it. Opening the door, Izuku's blood ran cold. Iri was huddled in the corner, shivering in her worn hospital gown, her face hauntingly gaunt. Her horn was gone, but Izuku knew it was likely she had a proficiency like Tenra's. Mutations didn't seem to exist in Risteria. Please, D don't hurt me. Iri pleaded. I'll be good, I promise. Iri, it's okay now. 
Izuku spoke, the young girl's head spinning around to look at him. Izuku saw the breath catching in Iri's throat. Because I am here. Izuku finished decisively. You're, you're the hero the other bad man took, aren't you? Iri questioned, silent tears streaming down her face. Not yet, I'm still in training. Izuku admitted, you tried to save me. Iri spoke sadly. The bad man said you died. He told me that I s stopped you from escaping. There was no way I was going to leave you with him. Izuku stated, but, but, I don't want people to get hurt because of me. No, Izuku declared, overhaul. All for one, they've hurt people, but never think for one second it is your fault. You cannot blame yourself for the actions of others. Yuri sniffled, but nodded. Izuku severely doubted he'd fixed a lifetime's worth of emotional abuse and manipulation with a few words. But it was a first step. W what's your name? Izuku paused. He knew wasn't talking about his actual name, but his hero name, something he didn't have yet. He knew Momo and the others had picked theirs, but Izuku hadn't given it much thought, preferring to focus on escaping the simulation. Slowly, the green-haired boy's hand lowered to the sword strapped to his belt, his fingertips crackling with power as he touched it, filling him with reassurance. Hinode. Izuku finally spoke. Corksmith hero, Hinode. Hinode offered his hand out to the small girl. Are you ready to go? Because from now on, you write your own future. Eri crashed into Izuku, hugging him tightly. With a relieved smile, Izuku placed an arm around her, supporting her as she clung onto him, and stood. Now it's time to get out of here. I'm at the exit. Nana spoke from the earpiece. Izuku produced a small tablet, created by his copy of Momo's quirk, comparing his location to Nana's. At least I still have creation. Checking Nana's location, Izuku set off, holding Iri near. Let's go, Iri. Six floors up, Izuku turned a corner, still balancing Iri with one arm. A crash came from in front of them, making Iri flinch. It's okay. Izuku reassured the young girl. That must be Nana, she's a hero, and my grandmother. Grandmother, Iri questioned, tilting her head. What's that? Izuku's heart clenched. The poor girl had been robbed of her childhood, of normality. Someone who looks out for me. Izuku nodded. You'll see in a second. Izuku rounded the corner, faced with the sight of Nana surrounded by a horde of Namu. Behind her was a doorway it looked like she was defending. The white void was encroaching. Izuku could see it at the other end of the corridor. Nana. Izuku, go. Nana blocked a Namu's punch, revealing a graze on her side. The way out is through there. Take the girl and go. I'll be right after you. They both knew she was lying. With a final look, Izuku steeled himself and secured his hold on Iri. Running forwards, Izuku dodged under the swing of Anamu and through the doorway. Turning the corner, Izuku found a swirling white portal in front of them. Setting Iri down, Izuku looked between the portal and the way they'd just come. Iri, I need you to be brave now. Izuku spoke. I need to go back and help Nana get here. You need to go through without me. Be but I'll be all alone again. Iri sniffled, tears beginning to form. No, I'll find you. Izuku stated. I'll save you, Iri. Hesitating, Iri finally nodded. Great, I promise I'll rescue you, Izuku said. And Hino doesn't break his promises. Iri let go of Izuku's hand, turning her body towards the portal, but not taking her eyes off Izuku. With a reassuring nod, Izuku watched as Iri ambled forwards and through the portal, vanishing from sight. It'll be okay, Iri. Drawing his blade, Izuku turned, heading back the way he came. Nana dropped to one knee. Holding the injury in her side as the Namu bore down on her, Yuik knocked from her grip by the last attack. Inko, Katero, Toshi. Nana lowered her head. I'm sorry I couldn't make it home. Just as the Namu brought its fist down on her, an emerald green blade appeared from behind her, burying itself in its chest and carrying it into the white void, vanishing as it did. Nana, Izuku cried, lifting his grandmother's arm around his shoulder. No, Izuku, go. Nana spoke weakly. Leave me. We'll never make it. We will, Izuku replied defiantly, supporting Nana as she hobbled with him towards the exit. Hinode, one for all. Nana murmured. The sword, it's gone, you threw it away. To save you, Izuku grunted, a grim smile on his face. I've decided I'll be the hero who saves everybody. Activating endurance, Izuku channeled his motivation and drive into the quirk, feeling it noticeably enhancing his strength and speed. As they rounded the bend in the corridor the void crept closer, only a few steps behind them now. On the other side of the portal Izuku could see the void was closing in from that direction as well. Staring at the portal, Izuku made his calculations. Even with all 60% of one for all he could use right now, endurance and the one strength quirk all for one hadn't taken, it wasn't enough. Izuku didn't have enough strength to propel himself and Nana into the portal before the void closed on them. No, Izuku, you can't. Nana protested, weakly trying to free herself from Izuku's grip. Tell them I'm sorry. Izuku spoke, gathering 60% one for all, endurance and strength in his arm. Iri, Momo, Kakin, All Might, Mom. Tell them I'm sorry I didn't keep my promise. Please, no. Oklahoma smash. Planting one foot, Izuku spun on the spot, swinging Nana around and launching her towards the portal at speed. Izuku, 
The green-haired teen watched as Nana vanished into the portal, her hand desperately reaching out for him. I'm sorry, Izuku uttered as he dropped to one knee, both his arms broken. It was the only way for one of us to make it out. Izuku planted his leg down on the stone floor and pushed himself back to his feet. Just because I know I can't make it doesn't mean I should give up. Using all his strength again, this time manifested in his legs, Izuku leapt towards the portal, broken arms flapping uselessly at his side. The portal closed, Izuku's broken body passing through the empty space where it had just been. Rolling to a stop, Izuku stared up at the endless white void that surrounded him. Every trace of Risteria, including the leather armor he'd been wearing, was gone. All four of his limbs were broken, hyper-regeneration setting to work on healing them. Clapping, coming from behind Izuku. You were so close. Blackthorn chuckled. You actually nearly made it. Of course if you'd had made it in time I would have just stopped you. What? Don't you get it? Blackthorn questioned. This was always just a bit of fun for me. Nana Shimura and the brat were just there for stakes. They're not really of interest. Stakes, of course, just to motivate you. All you did was wake them up. All for one will have them sedated and stored safely away before they can even blink. Blackthorn explained. Smug superiority in his every word. You achieved nothing. There was no blaze of glory, no final act of defiance, just a futile attempt to change an immutable fate. How pathetic. Izuku struggled against his broken limbs, trying to climb to his feet. Now, now, calm down. Blackthorn rolled his eyes. Like I said, this game is chess and you clearly don't know how to play. His still healing arms gave out from under him, Izuku crumpling to the floor of the void. Blackthorn held his arm out, sharpening it to a point as he strolled towards Izuku. Be fire breath. Raising his head, Izuku took a deep breath and released a gout of fire at Blackthorn. Or at least he tried to. Nothing happened. Nice try. Blackthorn drawled. But remember, I can access any and every quirk all for one possesses. I think this one is my new favorite. Izuku looked up to see Blackthorn's normally red eyes glowing brightly. The razor. Izuku grunted, paired with moist eyes. Blackthorn added. An excellent combination. Negating the dry eyes erasure causes. Izuku spoke as he struggled and failed to stand, his healing cancelled by erasure. Blackthorn resumed his approach. Now, Midoriya, this is your end. Staring up, Izuku watched as Blackthorn stabbed downwards with his forearm spike. No, Blackthorn's severed arm dropped to the floor next to Izuku, followed seconds later by his detached torso. The razor ended, hyper-regeneration kicking in with a vengeance, pain shooting through Izuku's limbs as the quirk fixed them in a few seconds. Standing, Izuku looked up. Izure. The alternate nodded, a small smile on his face, hinnowed in his grip. I couldn't let you face him alone. Izure assured. I told you, I'm a god. The two teens turned to see Blackthorn's body dissolve to black smoke, before reforming whole and unmarred. I control every aspect of this world. Blackthorn bragged. You cannot kill me. Clearly you can't control everything. Izure retorted. I came back didn't I? And you will vanish again. Blackthorn announced, with a dramatic swish of his hand. Nothing happened. A vein throbbed in Blackthorn's forehead. What have you done? Why cannot I not? I'm a part of Izuku, and Izuku's a part of me. Izur declared. You can't banish people from the real world, hence you can't banish me. It just took me a little while to realize I could ignore your attempts. No matter, I will kill you both. You won't. Izuku uttered. We'll beat you and restore Risteria. Risteria is gone. I've already deleted it. Blackthorn retorted. Besides, what are you going to do? Beat me up until I agree to do as you say. Well, it's a start at least. Izur commented. Izuku nodded. The two burst into action. Izuku using slingshot to push himself into the air while Izur cast one of Tenra's spells, enhancing his own speed. Blackthorn's eyes turned red, erasing Izuku's quirks as he fell towards the villain. Izur got there first, an accelerated punch striking Blackthorn in the temple. The villain barely shifted, but it was enough to make him blink. Izuku's quirks returning to him, using rock hard to turn his forearm to diamond. Izuku enhanced his strength with 5% OFA and endurance. With a crack like a gunshot, Izuku's fist slammed into Blackthorn's nose, shattering it in a spray of blood and sending the villain sprawling, not giving the villain time to gather his bearings. Izur cast Hany's spells, before using webbing to wrap Blackthorn up and launch him into the air. Crouching, Izuku charged his strength quirks into his legs and jumped after Blackthorn. With the graze of his fingertips, Izuku activated Slingshot's secondary ability, freezing Blackthorn in place. Detroit Smash Izuku drove his fist, with all 60% of one for all's power, into Blackthorn's gut. The villain was moved higher, an elastic tension in the air, clutching his broken arm. Izuku spun around and released Slingshot, watching as the villain slammed into the floor at incredible speed. Bloody and broken, Blackthorn lay face down, unmoving except for his breathing. Landing next to his alternate, Izuku slowly approached the villain. We can do this forever. Izuku spoke. You clearly are just a pale copy. All those quirks and you barely know how to use them. You fight us for an eternity, or admit defeat. 
I am not defeated. Blackthorn hissed, rising as his body pulled itself back together. I only need you to slip up once. I can take the punishment you deal forever. You'll get careless and slip up eventually. Izuku's mind raced, searching for a way to overcome Blackthorn's power. Six-year-old Izuku Midoriya sat at the kitchen table, laptop open to one side and a deck card in his hands. Without looking it away from the screen, Izuku tried to mimic the sleight of hand. The cards exploded out of Izuku's grip directly into his face. With a groan, Izuku let his head drop onto the surface of the table. Vibrations passed through the wood, making Izuku shoot back up to sit up straight. Drink up, it's getting hot out today. A smile split Izuku's face, his hands grabbing the can of All Might Cola with both hands, drinking deeply from it. Careful there, don't want you drowning. Hisashi Midoriya teased, lowering himself into the seat next to his son. Don't be silly. Izuku lowered the now empty can. There is nowhere enough cola for me to drown in. Oh, right, I see. Hisashi smiled. So what are you looking at? Magic 101, card tricks for beginners. Yeah, I thought that since I don't have a quirk, I thought that maybe I could use magic as an underground hero. Izuku admitted bashfully. Hisashi stopped the video. HM, well, first of all, you're going about it all wrong. Izuku tilted his head, looking at his father with confusion. The first principle of magic isn't card tricks, it's misdirection. Hisashi explained as he gathered up the scattered cards. You keep them watching exactly what you want them to see, while you do what you want without them seeing. Whoa, can you check the laptop for me? Hisashi smirked. Izuku nodded, turning to see the laptop was gone. Wait, where did it go? Right here. Hisashi held up the closed device. See what I meant? Izuku nodded his head vigorously. Yeah, I do. You keep them watching exactly what you want them to see. Izuku held out his hand, Yuik appearing from the void and coming to rest in palm. Izur, let's merge. Really? Izur frowned. Are you sure we can even do that again? We have to try. Together we could have the strength to deal enough damage to beat him. Izuku stated, stepping closer to Azure. Blackthorn rolled his eyes. It won't work, I patched that bug. But the two didn't listen, clasping hands as red smoke suddenly exploded out, obscuring them entirely. Blackthorn took a step back, covering his face with his arm. Slowly, the smoke cleared, revealing just one of the brats, a sword in each hand, hair blowing in a non-existent breeze. It worked. The brat looked down, examining himself. We did it. How did you do it? Blackthorn snarled, activating erasure in moist eyes, stalking towards the brat. I don't have to answer to you. The brat retorted, crouching down and leaping forwards. Swinging the green blade, a wave of fire washed over Blackthorn, a fire-resistance quirk protecting him instinctively. The second blade sent ice washing over him, exploiting the weakness to cold his fire-resistance quirk gave him. Limbs locking up. Blackthorn couldn't protect himself as the brat aimed his blue sword at him. A beam of light blasted from it, slamming into Blackthorn's chest and sending him flying backwards. The brat stalked towards him as Blackthorn pushed himself up. Fine, I bore of this. Flicking his fingers, Blackthorn increased the personal gravity on the brat, forcing him to the ground as he cried out in place. Excellent, now you're exactly where I want you. Blackthorn drawled. Funny, I was going to say the same thing. Hands closed around Blackthorn's face from behind. Izuku activated two becomes one, his body blurring as he merged with Blackthorn. He found himself in the villain's quirk space, in contrast to his own, a black void, and Izzur's, a henge on a hill, it was field of bones, gravestones with quirk names, the original holder's names and dates, as far as the eyes could see. Bones crunched underfoot. Izuku turned, Blackthorn prowled towards him. What is this place? The villain demanded. Tell me, if Resteria is where you are all powerful. Izuku stated, this is where I am. Blurring forwards, Izuku grabbed all for one's temples with his hand. He may not be able to use Quirksmith to alter his own quirks, the dampener stopping him, but it didn't stop him from altering others' quirks. Searching through the sheer volume of quirks, Izuku found what he was looking for. Dreamscape. Your power is fragile. Izuku spoke. All it takes is a single blow. Izuku made one change, severing the connection between Blackthorn and the real all for one. The gravestones around them scattered into dust, the bones under their feet fading away, and suddenly, they were back in reality, except the white void was gone, the castle's corridor had returned. Blackthorn sprawled to the floor, the vast majority of his power gone, only overhaul remaining. How? Blackthorn uttered. Izuku crouched down. Simple, in chess I'm the magician. Not a piece, but a playstyle. You were too busy looking at the queen, you didn't see the pawn that put you into checkmate. You do know how to play chess. Of course I do. Izuku responded. You want to feel intellectually superior so I let, I let you underestimate me. That was your undoing. I'm not done yet. Blackthorn hissed, pressing his hands to the floor, reshaping it into spikes that shot at Izuku and Izur. A laser beam shot past Izuku and Izur, obliterating the spikes and slamming into Blackthorn. See, I always sparkle. 
Yurio declared as he struck a pose. Blackthorn didn't halt, the floor rising up and trapping Yurio, slowly tightening. Nice try, Mika exclaimed, disintegrating the bindings around her friend and floor under Blackthorn's feet. Before he could hit the floor below a wave of water washed over Blackthorn, slamming him against the far wall, cracking it with the sheer force of the water. Smoke gathered around Blackthorn's hunched form, solidifying into a hand grasping his ankle and dragging him down along the floor towards Miyuchi, slapping his hand against the floor. Blackthorn used overhaul to sever the smoke arm. Before he could do anything, a fist formed of smoke slammed into Blackthorn's chest, sending him sprawling. An enlarged foot came down on the villain, sending him through the floor and the one below it as well. Mashira shrank back to his natural size. He's all yours, Denshi. On the floor Blackthorn was now on Denshi raced down the corridor, touching every stone brick and block in the walls and floor as he shot past the villain. What the hell? Blackthorn frowned as the walls and floor began to glow. Enjoy. Denshi grinned, shooting finger guns at the villain. The corridor exploded, consuming Blackthorn in smoke and dust. A bear charged into the cloud, followed by Blackthorn being expelled from the other side at speed, smashing through the outer wall of the castle. Blackthorn was greeted by the fist of a giant Rikimu, sending the villain flying higher into the air. Majiri appeared from around the corner, kicking Blackthorn back into the castle, this time on a higher floor. Blackthorn rolled to a halt, his body battered and bloody, but not stopped. Enjoy. Hakaio smirked, before releasing a sonic scream. Blown back out of the hole in the wall, Blackthorn fell towards the ground, only for Hanny to swing in and web him up, before spinning and slamming him into the floor. Shadows appeared from the floor, encasing Blackthorn and beginning to constrict him. Reaching out, Blackthorn destroyed the constructs with overhaul, freeing himself. A giant fist slammed through the wall, sending Blackthorn through wall after wall until he lost enough momentum to bounce off the next wall. Groaning, Blackthorn stood, only to find Hisama and Hayaso by waiting for him. Shit. With the combination of ice and fire, the two halves of a hole combined their attacks, creating an expansion effect that exploded in Blackthorn's face. The entire corner of the castle collapsed. Blackthorn peppered with rubble as he landed in the ruins of the Priory. I've been looking forward to this, Kacha announced as she cast a spell, sending Blackthorn floating high into the sky. Release. Just before Blackthorn hit the ground a kick landed in his stomach, amplifying the force of his impact with the earth. Tenra skidded to a halt. Now, a red dragon swooped in, cat on his back, snatching a badly beaten Blackthorn in his claws. Flying above the castle, Ai released Blackthorn, followed by Cat firing a concussive blast directly into the villain, increasing the force as he slammed through every floor of the castle, rubble and debris burying him. Slowly, the rubble shifted, Izuku using slingshot to dig the villain out of the crater where the castle once was. It's over. Izuku spoke, looking down at Blackthorn, the man mangled and broken. You've lost. Blackthorn began to laugh, slowly at first, becoming more and more hysterical before Izuku used variable mist to breathe knockout gas in his face. Risteria is back. Izuku breathed with satisfaction, looking around the rolling hills in the distance. It is, Izuku replied, dropping down from a half-destroyed wall and moving to stand at his alternate side. How did you do it? I edited the quirk that supported Risteria, Dreamscape. Broke the connection, it's a world in its own right now, as real as any other. Real or maybe. Izzer mused, echoing Ruck's words. It's time for you to go home now, isn't it? Izuku nodded. Home, the long way round. Will you ever be able to come back? I don't know. Izuku answered honestly. Then, good luck. Izzer pulled his alternate into a tight hug. Stay safe. Try not to end up in any more comas, at least for a while. I'll try. You'd better. Izzer retorted playfully. The world feels different now, doesn't it? An oppressive hand I never realized was there is gone. Izuku nodded. There's no pre-written script anymore. The story you create now, it's all your own. Don't you go forgetting about us. Izzer joked, his lips quirking into a smile. Izuku laughed. I couldn't even if I wanted to. Thank you, Izzer, for coming back. It's your turn to go back now. Izzer nodded towards Izuku's hand, raising it. Izuku watched as his appendage began to fade out of existence. Looks like I'm waking up. Footsteps pounded, the rest of the infiltration squad rounding the corner. Tenra, Tacha, Sancho, Hakayo, Denshi, Kat. Ai, Hani, Mika, Yurio, Mashira, Rikamu, Toka, Majri, Fumu, Tsunwiri, Kuva, Izur. Izuku smiled, bowing to them all. Thank you. Izuku faded from existence. Flashing lights. A heart rate monitor. Izuku. Please. No, no, no. Mom. He's gone into cardiac arrest. Ms. Midoriya. Please stand back. Please, Izuku. You can't die. Someone get recovery girl. Izuku gasped as he sat bolt upright. He was back at the train station, the white surfaces practically blinding him. Huh, so you did take the wrong train. You're lucky I managed to pull you back here in time. 
Izuku stood, turning to see Ziroth standing by the timetable. What? I was in my own body. I was waking up. Ziroth gestured to the timetable. Have a look. Izuku moved to stand next to the vestige. His eyes scanned the timetable. I didn't take the wrong one. I was right. I took the train back to my own body. Izuku spoke. The other one would have taken me to the clone. Not death. You said the other train would take me to the afterlife. What I said was that the other train was passing on. Ziroth replied, with a shrug. You assumed it was the afterlife. Then how was going back to my own body the wrong choice? Izuku questioned. Do you think all for one didn't plan for the eventuality that you may survive? That you may defeat his inferior copy? Izuku lowered his head. In the brief moment I was back in my body, I was in cardiac arrest. I was dying. If I die, my quirks, one for all, transfer to the clone. Exactly. All for one must have forced another quirk on you. Probably some kind of temporary heart-stopping quirk altered by Quirksmith to turn back on the holder. Just like the quirk dampener. Izuku clenched his fists. If I die, all for one wins. He gets one for all, he becomes unstoppable. A whistle blew. A train pulled into the station. Izuku raised his head. I know what I have to do. Making his choice, Izuku boarded the train, the doors shutting behind him. Home, the long way round. His surroundings dissolved into Inkai blackness, an empty void. Bold move, kid. Zeroth's disembodied voice chuckled. Let's see if it pays off. It has to. And then, nothing. Izuku Midoriya opened his eyes. End of Risteria Fantasy Arc. Pain, the unending pain. Thoughts evaded Gurren Tsubasa, washing away like leaves on a river. He wanted to rip, to tear his foul abomination of a body to pieces, to be free. Free of the pain. Free of the voices begging for the same end he wished for, trapped in their final moments. Before they became part of him. Inamu. A monster. But he couldn't. Gurren had no control of his body anymore. A passenger along for the tortuous ride. It responded to him no longer. He was nothing more than a beast on all for one's leash. His grandfather's plaything. An experiment. The cruel visage of his twisted grandfather appeared on the other side of the glass tube he was contained in. I do wonder, can you hear me, dearest creation? Gurren wanted to scream, to shout, to smash through the glass and rip the bastard's throat out. A fist slammed into the side of his grandfather's face, a spray of blood splashing across the glass. You always were a creepy bastard, should have known you'd be in league with a fucker like all for one. His grandfather's attacker stepped into view. Back you go. Older than Gurren remembered, 15 or 16, he hadn't thought it had been that long. The blonde-haired teen was covered in scrapes. His t-shirt had a burn in the center of the chest, revealing charred skin below. A cut ran along the right side of his jaw, blood dripping from it. Baku, Gurren's childhood friend turned, staring up at the monster in the chamber. The Bakugo, Subasa. Bakugo's eyes were wide, filled with a fear that looked entirely foreign to them. Kai kill me. The 5th of May 2179. Minoru started to back away slowly, but Surobadai rolled her eyes. Must we go through this every time? A little birdie told me you were going to stop. In an instant Minoru's entire body locked up, stopping dead. There we are. But Sura rolled. So dramatic. As usual, such a girl. Minoru flinched. Now, here we are, alone at last, no distractions. But Sura's lips morphed into a predatory smile. It's time to come home, piglet. This has gone on long enough. And no. Minoru grunted, fighting through a locked jaw. But Sura's nostrils flared dangerously. Minoru, I grow bored of this dance, we both know how it will end, well actually, you don't remember. Minoru's eyes widened. The little birdie told me that you're going to come home with me, you're going to be happy about it, and you'll forget all about this and my quirk. Atsuro's eyes flashed a sickly purple. Minoru's struggles ceased immediately, freed from Atsuro's verbal binding. Mom, Minoru questioned, frowning. What are you doing here? Well, my boss sent me with some paperwork for the sports festival. Atsuro smiled warmly, hugging Minoru. I'm so proud of you, you were such a cute little man out there. Minoru ignored a strange feeling, radiating from the purple teen's stomach, like that moment just after danger passed. Sure, I want to come home, now. But Suro smiled and nodded. Let's go home then. The woman placed a hand on Minoru's shoulder, guiding towards a secluded area. Why are we stopping? Like you wanted, we're going home. But Suro drawled. Purple smoke began to swirl, the sight filling Minoru with fear and dread. It meant only one thing. Kurajiri. T that's, a good friend. Atsuro smirked. Thank you for this, Kirajiri. Yellow eyes opened in the mist, as if I have a choice. Now, now, no need to get stroppy. Atsuro retorted. Get through there, piglet. Minoru was pushed, stumbling through the portal and onto his belly. CCH, pathetic. Atsuro sneered as she stepped from the mist, forcing himself to stand. Minoru looked around. It was the Bonai family mansion in Yokohama, a place from Minoru's childhood, where they had lived during their early years. Minoru's memories of those first nine years were hazy at best, full of holes. This place, it's home now, Minoru. 
Atsuru spoke. It's time to learn about your legacy, the truth to your purpose. My purpose? Minoru questioned. You won't be returning to UA, Piglet. You're going to be homeschooled from now on. Atsuru replied. Allowing you to go in the first place was a mistake. Look how they overfed you. You've gotten fat. We'll have to fix that. Minoru was hyperventilating, terrified at the idea of Atsuru's control over their entire life once more. Grasping at the balls on his scalp, Minoru threw them at Atsuro's feet, trapping them in place. Feet pounding, Minoru sprinted towards the main doors, towards freedom. A little birdie told me you're going to freeze right where you are. Minoru's body locked up entirely, unable to move. My body, I can't move. Atsuro sniffed in annoyance. Stop making me use my quirk. But you're quirkless, Minoru uttered. Have you hidden it all this time? You know what? I can't be bothered making you forget about it anymore. Atsuro sighed. This will be much simpler. A little birdie told me you can't leave the mansion grounds, you can't contact the outside world. Minoru could move again, wasting no time racing out the house and towards the gates. But within five feet of the gates, Minoru's body stopped, before turning and walking back into the mansion. Your quirk, it's mind control. Oh, it's far more than just mind control. But Suru bragged. Whoever my target is, his mind is putty in my hands, I can remake him from the ground up. Him, not them or her. Minoru looked up defiantly. Your quirk only works on men, not women or non-binary people. Atsuru gave a mocking laugh. You're not planning on falling back on that old fantasy. Old fantasy? Minoru questioned. Atsuru rolled her eyes. Of course, I made you forget. Minoru backed away as Atsuru approached. You're my precious little man, don't you ever forget that. Atsuru whispered into Minoru's ear. Now, how about you go to your room? I laid out a dashing tuxedo for you, we're having company tonight. Minoru sat in the bedroom. Decorated with all the fixings he remembered from his childhood, sighing, Minoru stared down at the phone resting in his palm. Phone calls wouldn't connect. There was no WIFI, mobile data wasn't working. Not even emergency calls. Removing the UA gym jacket he was still wearing, Minoru folded it up and moved to the dresser. Selecting the second from the bottom drawer, Minoru dug right to the back. I have to hide it, otherwise she'll take it from me. Physical evidence that I attended UA, even if she makes me forget it. Makes me forget Sue. Minoru's hand brushed something unexpected, pulling it out to reveal a child's summer dress, patterned with flowers. Ironically, considering the malnutrited state of Minoru, it would probably still fit him. How did this get here? Why do I have it? Was it mine? Hesitating on whether or not to discard the dress, Minoru found himself shoving it back into the drawer, along with the jacket. It was important, just like the UA jacket. Minoru, you've got ten minutes to be ready. Atsuru's voice called from afar. If you've not by then, I'll have to come and dress you myself. Minoru shivered, standing tall and turning attention to the child's tuxedo on the bed. I hate it. I'll fix it. Minoru had always had an eye for fashion. Even from a young age, and on the few occasions they'd been allowed to dress freely, had formed a distinctive style. Removing their UA gym trousers, Minoru pulled out the pins that were used to turn up the legs. The smallest size was still too big for him. Focusing on the suit pants, Minoru shortened them to mid-calf, pairing them with dark red plimsolls from when she he had been learning ballet as a child. Discarding the crisp white shirt, Minoru dug through the wardrobe, finding a shirt that matched the shoes. Pulling it on, followed by the jacket, Minoru rolled up the sleeves of both to the midpoint of the forearm. Finally, Minoru left the top two buttons undone, the bow tie hanging loose around the neck. Done, much better, stealing herself himself for the backlash that was about to come. Minoru left his room, striding purposefully towards the dining hall. Minoru made it barely three steps inside the room before an apulxic screech nearly deafened him. What the hell are you wearing? Are you trying to look like a freak? Atsuru hissed as she grabbed her child by the lapel. Are you trying to embarrass me by dressing like one of those mutants? Minoru frowned. But I have a heteromorphic quirk. Don't play dumb with me. I'm not talking about your worthless quirk. Atsuru had tightened around Minoru's throat. A little birdie told me. None of that, Atsuru. Minoru watched in surprise as his mother froze dead, trembling slightly at the cordial voice. Grandfather, Atsuro spun around, bowing deeply. I wasn't aware you were coming to the party. I fancied a break from my work. Minoru stared at the man, tall and broad-shouldered, his white hair mid-length and shaggy, reminding him somewhat of Midoriya and red eyes. Grandfather, that means that he's my great-grandfather. He looks way too young, though. Minoru, such an antique sense of style, how fascinating. The white-haired man tilted his head back, revealing a ragged scar from under his left eye and down over the curve of his jaw. H.M., you don't remember me, do you, child? Minoru hesitated, before shaking his head. I thought so. The man chuckled. You were only eight the last time we met. And with your mother's liberal use of her quirk it's not all that surprising. Minoru's eyes widened. He knows about her quirk. Granddaughter, 
The attention turned back to Atsuro, a sigh of relief escaping Minoru's lungs. He will not use your quirk on your child again, do you understand me? The man spoke calmly. I could take that power from you in an instant. Atsuro bowed her head. I understand, sensei. Suddenly, the oppressive atmosphere cleared. Excellent. Let's enjoy this party, shall we? Minoru nodded, leaving as soon as possible, taking the seat with the corresponding name card. I lied. All for one spoke in the moment his descendant left earshot. If you use your quirk on your child again I will kill you, no matter how much you beg or plead. Atsuro nodded, before leaving his presence like the devil was on her heels. In many ways, he was. All for one regarded his great-great-grandchild, sat at the table, shoulders hunched, clearly unwilling to be there. Atsuro has piled layers upon layers of compulsions onto Minoru, a fragile, interwoven shell of lies. One day, not long from now, they'll crack, like an egg. All for one activated a suite of quirks, careful not to disturb the ones creating the mirage of his face that hid his injuries. Dreamscape, telepathy, mental connection. In a few short seconds, all for one created a link between Minoru and the dream world, just as he had done for Yoichi all those years ago. Minoru would dream of that world, and finally see who really existed under all its heroes compulsion. The egg of lies would crack soon, but I'll speed things along a bit. This should be interesting. That night, in the child's bed that was concerningly exactly the right size, Minoru went to sleep, only to wake up immediately. I'm not in Kansas anymore. Minoru breathed as he stared out of the window as the fantasy city that sprawled as far as the eye could see. Something felt off. Minoru noticed, like an old pain that had suddenly vanished. Minoru looked down. Holy woe. Well. What the hell? Minoru looked around the bedroom he had awoken in, eyes eventually landing on a mirror, striding in front of it. Minoru felt the breath catch at the back of his throat. I'm a girl. Minoru murmured, staring at the reflection. I have actual hair, and it's so long. A laugh slipped from his lips, or rather, her lips. Her seems to fit me better. Maybe it's just a side effect of all this. Neum, your shift starts in ten minutes, don't be late. Neum, that must be my name, wherever this is. Neum, Minoru spoke. The name felt odd on her tongue, a wave of warmth spreading down her body and limbs. Neum smiled. This is amazing. The 15th of May 2179. Minoru watched the screen with dread. He felt sick. We at MNS would like to offer our condolences to his mother and those who were close to the Midoriya family. Yue will be holding a vigil for Izuku Midoriya on the 20th, and he will be buried with full honors granted to pro heroes who have fallen in battle. The image on the TV changed, now showing a still of Midoriya taken after the cavalry battle. In his hand was the 10 million point band, the green-haired boy grinning wildly. Finally, text faded into view, overlaying the image. Izuku Midoriya, 15.07. 2163 to 10.05.2179. Midoriya was gone, taken the same day Minoru was, at the sports festival just like him. Sobs racked Minoru, crying alone in the childhood bedroom that was only vaguely remembered. Midoriya had saved them, more than once, during the USJ attack, getting hurt again and again in their places. It's not fair. Midoriya deserved to be a hero, a real hero, not just some vain child in it for the attention or need for the validation Itsuro had never given like Minoru. It should have been Minoru who died, not Midoriya. You are already a hero. A sudden pressure built up in Minoru's head, crying out in pain. You can't just wipe her memory. It's not normal. It's unnatural. It's for his own good. He can fit it, be normal. I won't let you do this. You can't stop me. A little birdie told me you got out of my way. Slowly, Minoru came back to reality. Her his head pounding like a drum. It felt so real, like a half-forgotten memory. And I think I know who made me forget it. The 1st of June 2179. Miyum, as she'd decided to call herself in this weird dream world she visited every night, had been cleaning down a table when she heard the rumors. Some kind of blur shot across the sky toward the royal grounds. I wonder if it was an attack. Apparently it was some kid who didn't have an entry coin, a boy. Miyum shook her head. It sounded like some reckless Izuku would do. Of course, he'll never do anything ever again. Faltering, Miyum stood up straight, staring down at the half-clean table. Her friend was gone. Dead. She'd never told him how she felt about him. It had been a small crush, quickly overshadowed by her growing feelings for Tsu, but nonetheless, she wished she'd had the chance. What's that noise? Meme looked up, brow furrowing as she saw the tankards around her vibrate every second. And then came the screams. Monsters from the south. Run. Panic set in immediately. The patrons of the tavern fleeing immediately. Carried outside by the crush, Meme looked up to see massive Namu, the size of skyscrapers, looming over Sarander. There's more. Miyum turned her head. Two more Namu, human-sized, stalked out of an alleyway, a portal closing behind them. The crowd scattered, leaving Miyum standing alone. Her mind screamed at her feet to move, to run, but they wouldn't. Miyum knew she couldn't win against them. Her proficiency in here was just as weak as her quirk in the real world. The first Namu charged at her. 
Without thinking, Mium transformed her arms into ooze. The Namu's claw bounced off her raised arms, shattering the limb with the reflected energy. Mium stared at her undamaged arms. This power, I have a chance. Looking up, Mium watched as the Namu that had attacked her regrew its arm. That's just cheating. Mium groaned. The other Namu attacked this time, swiping for her head. Dropping the conversion of her arms, she switched it to her head and shoulders, turning them to ooze. Again, the Namu's arm was turned to rubble and earth, before repairing itself. An explosion rocketed the street, Mium turning her head to see the head of one of the giant Namu detonate, the rest of its body crumbling away after it. The head, that's the weak point, Mium realized, turning her attention back to the smaller Namu, a plan formulating in her mind, dodging the Namu's claws. Mium turned her arm into liquid form and used it to encase the Namu's head. With a single mental command, the ooze contracted, crushing the Namu's head. As the first monster crumbled to dust, Mium turned to face the other. With a roar, no doubt enraged by its brethren's destruction, the remaining Namu charged at her. A cloud of dust blew over her, arm retracting from the remains of the second Namu's head. Mium returned her body to normal, breathing a sigh of relief. I did it, I won. The 4th of June 2179. Anger shot through Mium, she spun around, transforming her arm into liquid as she did, thrusting it towards the bastard who earned her ire. Mium pinned him against the wall. Are you okay? Mium glanced over. It was Ikaragi who had spoken. The bartender and owner of the tavern Mium had found herself working at when she'd woken up in Risteria this time. She was always in a different place, a different job. Every night she dreamed of this world that was only supposed to exist in fiction. The only constant was Ikaragi. Wherever she was, he was there as well, with a warm smile. What happened? Ikaragi questioned, concern written on his face. This prick just slapped my ass. Miyum, glaring at the pervert. Was I like this bastard? Am I still? I'll alert the bluecoats. Ikaragi assured, before wrapping his knuckles against the tarnished brass bell hung above the bar. The first time Miyum had seen it being used, she had thought it was some kind of joke. A magical bell that summoned the nearest available bluecoats. It alerted them via bracelets that would vibrate in harmony with the bell, getting stronger as they got closer to the source. Two bluecoats entered the tavern. Miyum recognized them immediately. Takoyami. With a cute red scarf and long, multicolored hair that made Miyum jealous and the class rep from 1B. Lieutenant Itsu, what's the problem? The kendo variant greeted, her orange-red hair tied up in a bun instead of her normal, more ornate, style. Miyum heard a whisper, a familiar voice, but she couldn't find the source. The Takoyami variant turned to look at two patrons. My name is Officer Fumu. Not whatever strange word you just said. Angling herself, Miyum's eyes landed on Midoriya, or at least, his variant here, with someone else who was blocked by another patron. However, judging by the hairstyle, Miyum could reasonably assume it was Yeyarazu's variant. It's okay now, miss. Itsu assured. You can release the spell. We'll take it from here. Miyum hesitated for a moment, before nodding. Her arm returning to normal, the bastard freed from her hold, only for him to land on his feet, making a dash for the still open tavern door. Itsu rolled her eyes. Fumu, catch. It was over in a few short seconds, shadowy restraints around his legs and torso, pinning him in place. You are under arrest on the suspicion of sexual assault. You retain the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be taken as evidence against you. Itsu recited as she unclipped handcuffs from her belt. You will now be taken to the nearest constabulary station where you will be interviewed with representation. Itsu bent down, using her handcuffs to restrain his hands in front of him. With a click, the handcuffs glowed for a few seconds before returning to normal. You have been fitted with magic damping restraints. Fumu spoke as he released his shadows and lifted the man to his feet. Any attempts to cast magic will be seen as an attempt to evade arrest and you will be charged with such. The pervert lifted his head, glaring at Miyum. Fucking bitch. All I was doing was showing my apparication. The pervert snarled. You should be flattered. You aren't even that attractive. Okay, that hurt. Bastard. Resisting the urge to activate her proficiency again and attack the bastard. Miyum instead settled on watching it to explain how exactly the pervert had incriminated himself. Serves him right. It's no wonder everyone hates me when I've behaved like this. Itsu spoke, grabbing Miyum's attention. If you wish to press charges you will need to give a statement at the next convenient time for yourself, miss. Without a moment's hesitation, the words rolled off her tongue. It's Miyum. Thank you, Lieutenant, Officer. You're welcome. Itsu gave a reassuring smile. Come along, Fumu. With that, they were gone, the atmosphere in the tavern ebbing back towards its prior state. But it didn't feel like it for Miyum. It felt like the walls were closing in. She was completely on edge, dreading another assault at any moment. Slowly, Miyum became aware of the eyes that rested on her. Looking up, Miyum's eyes met those of Midoriya's variant, just for a moment before he looked away. Miyum started. She'd seen something in his eyes she hadn't expected. Recognition. Is that the real Midoriya? Miyum shook her head. It couldn't be. Midoriya was dead. 
The 5th of June 2179. Minoru had seen a lot of faces come and go in the last month he'd been trapped in the manor. Only a few stayed the same. His mother, the man with the burns, the one who looked like Aizawa, the woman with the golden cords, Turajiri, Tamura Shigaraki. But Minoru hadn't seen his great-grandfather since the party on the first night he'd arrived. Minoru sighed, staring down at her his tray of food. It wasn't as empty as it had when he was living with just his mother. But he still went to bed hungry every night. A bowl of rice was placed onto his tray, followed by chopsticks. Minoru looked up. It was the scarred man, the one who reminded him of Todoroki. Eat up. A growing kid like you needs proper food. Minoru nodded. Thank you. What's your name? The man looked at him for a few moments, before shrugging. Toya, yours. Maita. So, you're bot eyes kid. Who would have thought she had a wannabe hero for a child? Toya mused, sitting opposite. Because she's, you know, a villain. And you aren't. Minoru questioned. I was like you once, but now I'm what I need to be, so no one else has to suffer like I did. Toya answered. At least I'm not the demented lunatic who makes people choke themselves to death, or rip their own eyes out, no offense. She's crazy, she uses her quirk to control me. Minoru explained. She deliberately starved me so my growth would be stunted, to keep me cute and childlike. That's messed up. Toya agreed. She makes my father look, well, not quite as bad. Still a flaming asshole though. Who's your father? Toya shot him a withering look. None of your business. Minoru nodded, turning his attention back to his food. So, you work for Tamura Shigaraki to get revenge on your father. I don't work for Tamura Shigaraki. I work for Sensei, Mr. Takabana. Toya answered. Tamura is a violent manchild who thinks he's the protagonist of a video game. Mr. Takabana. Toya frowned in confusion. Thirties, white hair, red eyes. The one you spoke to at that party when you first arrived. He's my great-grandfather. Minoru questioned. Something like that. Most of the others are related to him in some form or another. Toya answered. Clones, spliced hybrid children, or a further descendant like yourself. Minoru nodded. But who actually is he? Really, you don't know. After a moment's hesitation, Minda shook his head. He's all for one, the merchant of quirks, the first demon. Toya listed. That's just a myth. Minoru denied. He's more than a myth, he's a legend. Toya spoke. A living legend with the quirk of quirks, to give and take. Minoru sat in stunned silence. The boogeyman he'd heard whispers of in playgrounds and at sleepovers was real, and he was related to him. The 6th of June 2179. Minoru flipped the mirror over, he couldn't stand to see the reflection. The face that looked back. Because it wasn't Miyum's face. It was funny. Minoru had only had these dreams for a month, but he felt more comfortable as Miyum than he ever had as himself. Could I be? As soon as the thought entered Minoru's mind, it vanished, whisked away by a force that felt entirely foreign. It terrified her. Him. Her. Him. Not even his mind was his own. Was Minoru even real? How much of who he was, who he thought he was, was the result of Atsuro's quirk? Who am I? Moving over to the dresser, Minoru opened the second to bottom drawer, removing the dress hidden there, pulling it on over his t-shirt and shorts. Minoru stood, marveling at how it hung around his body, it felt so right. Minoru actually felt comfortable in his clothes, for the first time in so long. Spinning on the spot, Minoru laughed happily with how the dress flared around him. I really am. Again, the foreign force crushed the thought before it could be recognized. That night Minoru cried himself to sleep, hugging the dress tight. His mind was not his own. He would never be free to be his true self. But Surobadai had seen to that. The 7th of June 2179. Minoru awoke to the sound of knocking on the door. Izuku's alive. It's the real him. I spoke to him. Another knock pulled him from his thoughts. A shot of adrenaline burst through Minoru's system as he realized he'd fallen asleep in his dress. Clambering out of bed, Minoru pulled the dress off as quickly as he could without damaging it. Rushing to the dresser, Minoru quickly shoved it to the back, closing the drawer with a bit more force than required. I don't care about the dress. Minoru froze, fear followed by confusion. That wasn't his mother's voice, but his great-grandfather's, the man others called Sensei. All for one, he'll tell it's Uro. I'm not going to tell your mother, Minoru. All for one spoke again. There's something I want to show you. Minoru stood, still panicking somewhat. It was like he'd read his mind, which, considering his quirk, was entirely possible. Taking a few deep breaths, Minoru opened the door with as much faux calmness as he could muster. Hey, Minoru inwardly, and outwardly, cringed. You need a better poker face, come along, grandchild. All for one instructed, setting off at a brisk pace, closing his door. Miyum followed after, jogging at points just to keep up. All for one took him to the main elevator, of a modern design, a replacement for the old-fashioned one Minoru remembered from his childhood. Standing inside, Minoru shuffled aimlessly in the awkward silence. Why are you? There are some things I wish to show you, and others I wish to tell you. All for one interrupted. I'm sure by now you've become aware of who I am, of the legacy you were born into. You're a villain, Minoru stated. No, I'm a force of nature. All for one clarified. 
every force must have an equal and opposite reaction. There can be no heroes without villains. Minoru didn't respond. I only hate one hero. All for one explained. All Might, the man who almost killed me. All for one turned. And just for a brief moment Minoru saw a withered man with a respiration helmet. That was his true face, Minoru realized, hidden by some stolen glamour quirk. I almost died, at the hands of the very power I created. All for one spoke. I was born at the very beginning of the age of quirks, blessed with the magnificent power to give and take the quirks around me. My brother was not so lucky, born with a quirk he could never use for himself, a tree whose shade he could not enjoy. So you gave him a quirk that he could. Minoru mused. Exactly, a simple stockpiling ability to reinforce his ailing body. All for one responded, the elevator coming to a halt. The doors opened, revealing row upon row of cylindrical chambers, just like the ones Minoru saw coming and going from the house every day, just like the one with the white-haired clone of Midoriya. That stockpiling quirk merged with his original quirk, creating a power that could be passed on from person to person, growing stronger with every user. One for all. Minoru followed all for one as they walked through the laboratory, eyes wide at the sight of Namu in every tank, All Might's power and the same one he passed on to Izuku Midoriya. All for one continued. Ironic, that the power my brother gave away, one day returning to his nephew. All for one chuckled. You're not surprised, child. You spoke to Izuku in the dreamscape, didn't you? Minoru hesitated, before nodding. I thought that might happen. It's part of the reason I linked you to that world. All for one informed. You're the reason I'm having those dreams. Of course, I created that world, as a refuge for my brother when his body was too painful for him to bear. All for one replied. I gave you access so you could see who you are, under all the lies you're made to tell yourself. I'm a girl in there, how is that my real self? Minoru questioned. You'll see. All for one answered. Atsuro's commands have no effect in that world. Minoru frowned. Does that mean I'm really a G? A grating pain at the base of his skull frowned the thought out, Minoru's memory of it fading in seconds. Izuku Midoriya reminds me of myself, you know. The passion for quirks, so determined, defying the limits imposed on him. All for one remarked. I tried to kill him. Yet he simply refused, surviving injuries he should never have. They stopped at the tank that held the Midoriya clone. I have decided to grant him reprieve. Once one for all returns to me, I shall allow him his pick of quirks, heal him of his injuries. All for one explained. He will make an excellent opponent for he who comes next. He who comes next. Minoru questioned. Spoilers. All for one remarked. The two stood in silence for a moment, before Minoru spoke. Did you give my mother that quirk? Not with mine, no I didn't. All for one answered. There is an interesting quirk, pardon the pun, to our bloodline. We manifest a second quirk, during our teens, based heavily on our personality and desires. But only those of natural birth, clones and any of their spawn do not receive them. Was all for one your second quirk? Minoru questioned. It was, my first, decay, was beyond my reach at the time, and I wanted it back. All for one replied. Your mother was born quirkless, but manifested a quirk in her teens, to control men, and only men, with her words. If you say I may, you know. Minoru started, not daring to say or think the word, to avoid the compulsion. Then how come it works on me? For you, it is a house of cards. She convinced you to doubt yourself, without her quirk, just for a moment, and then layered the compulsions on top of that doubt. Minoru stared down blankly at his hands as they started to burn. Watching in shock, the skin began to ripple and morph, over and over. Looking into the reflective surface of one of the tanks, Minoru saw his body shifting and changing, the location of his spheres moving from one part of his body to the next every second, face contorting into others he recognized. 2. Midoriya. Liam. Shapeshifting. Minoru murmured. The manifestation has begun. All for one commented, placing a hand on Minoru's cheek. That will be a powerful quirk, reshape, versatile and complementary to your first. All that's needed now is for you to remember. Minoru went lightheaded and then knew only darkness, before the torrent washed over him. Memories of a childhood that slotted back into place one after another. The memories of a father wiped away, now restored. They were all back, all her memories, the ones that had been lost for so long. Now Minoru could see what Itsuro had done, wiping her father of the memories of her existence, controlling her, manipulating her with her quirk, making her believe a lie. The 8th of June 2179. She awoke to the sounds of the morning, birds chirping outside the window. For the first time in years, her head fell clear, thoughts no longer controlled or erased. Standing, she moved into the in-suit, staring at the face in the mirror, the one that didn't fit her. It never had. Mayum. The name felt right on her lips, a warm pulse of euphoria shooting through her body, radiating down her arms and legs. Closing her eyes, she concentrated. Using her new quirk to alter her body, flesh, muscle and bone shifting under the skin as it took new form. Focusing on her scalp, the generation point of her pop-off quirk vanished, no longer bound thanks to reshape. She felt her hair brushing against the back of her neck, 
Neum opened her eyes and stared into the mirror. Her eyes examined her purple hair, wonderfully long and actually real, falling past her shoulder. She drank in the contours of her face, seeing what she'd so envied in others, now hers. She felt right. She was Miyum. She was a girl. And no one was going to tell her otherwise. The lie she'd been told. The lie she'd been made to believe. Its power was gone. Minoru, the boy that never was, was gone. And Miyum was there. The truth had set her free. The 7th of June 2179. A manila folder landed on Tokyose Shikaku's desk, directly in front of him. Picking it up, the navy-haired man opened it, reading the contents. Kurai Kobamu. Date of birth, August 11, 2156, known vigilante, codename Forgotten. Tokyuse spoke aloud. Quirk, none. Why do you want my help with a quirkless perp? Sukachi sat on the edge of Tokyuse's desk, leaning in. Because he has a quirk. I need you to determine if this was a quirk that was hidden from the register, or if he is one of all for one's favor. Tokyuse nodded. Sure, where's he's being held? In an interrogation room downstairs. He was one of the escaped USJ villains, turned himself in, didn't attack the heroes. Sukachi explained as they both stood. Sansa just brought him from Mustafu General. He was attacked by other inmates. The quirk was noticed when he tried to defend himself. What is his quirk? Tokusei asked as they stepped into the lift. Barrier, it seems, not a particularly powerful variant of it. Sukachi answered. It's what makes me think AFO has something to do with it. The quirk has all the hallmarks of a first-generation quirk. Plus he insists that he doesn't know anything about the quirk. Something about the name is familiar, Kurai Kobamu. Tokusei mused. Sukachi nodded. A scandal a few years back, he applied to UA, Hero and General Streams, but was rejected from both despite passing both exams. Less me guess, because he was quirkless, right in one. Sukachi replied as the lift came to a halt, doors opening. The HPSC forced UA to reject him on the grounds of frail health, but someone in the faculty whistle blew a couple of years later, all over the papers. I remember that. It led to all Hero Academies being required by law to accept successful quirkless candidate. Tokusei noted. So why did Kobamu end up a villain? Vigilante became one after being rejected due to HPSC's interference, primarily focused on gathering intel on villains and passing it along to us or the heroes. Sukachi informed. We knew about him for years. He was a low-priority capture due to his non-violent nature. Why was a vigilante part of the League of Villains? He's not. The LOV recruited anyone and everyone for the USJ attack. He signed up, and on the day, he went through the portal, found a nice spot, and just sat there. Sukachi answered. In his interrogation afterwards he explained he joined the attack because he wanted to see Yue as if he'd been a student. Tokusei turned to avoid bumping into another detective. What's he been charged with? Not vigilantism, or villainy, since he didn't use a quirk to commit the crimes. Trespass, colluding with a villain, obstructing the course of justice, amongst others. Sukachi listed. And now this quirk has appeared. Suddenly the prosecution wants to offer him a plea deal they didn't before. Right. Now they know he's not quirkless he's worth their time, quirkist bastards. Tokusei grumbled. Let me guess. The HPSC Vigilante Rehabilitation Program. Tokusei followed his colleague into the room. Finding a dark-haired man handcuffed to the table, his face was dotted with cuts and bruises, far too well healed to be anything other than a result of a medical quirk. Sukachi pressed a button on his datapad, the handcuffs falling open. Kobamu rubbed his wrists, looking up to see a hand offered to him. Shaking the detective's hand, Kobamu turned to Tokusei. Are you the quirk reader? Kobamu queried. Because I'd really like to get to the bottom of this. Tokusei nodded and held out his hand. I am. Detective Tokusei Shikaku. Kurai Kobamu. But you're probably already aware of that. The man finished awkwardly. Yes, I am. Tokusei replied, taking the seat opposite Kobamu. When did you first notice your quirk? And please, tell the truth. Kobamu's eyes flicked at Tsukachi. I couldn't lie if I wanted to. Tokusei glanced at his colleague. He wondered if Tsukachi had been Forgotten's police contact. Excellent. Please continue. Kobamu nodded. At the prison, three days ago, I was attacked. I guess they didn't like having a quirkless around. They were hitting and hitting me. I just wanted it to stop. And then it did. I opened my eyes and there was this force field dome, protecting me. Tokusei nodded. You have to believe me. I have desperately wanted a quirk my entire life. If I'd had one all this time, well, I wouldn't have watched my dreams die because of bigotry. I believe you. Tokusei assured. Sukachi nodded. He's telling the truth. I know he is. Tokusei answered. Kobamu, prior to the incident have you been experiencing any unusual sensations, tingling, vibrations, in your body? Kobamu nodded. 
I have. Ever since the USJ incident, my whole body, but now it's gone. What was that? A side effect of quirk manifestation. Tokuse explained. Symptoms such as that can appear anywhere from minutes to months before the quirk manifests. Although these days it tends to be days at most. Please, help me understand. Kobamu pleaded, holding out his hand. Tokuse took it, and activated quirk space. A white void appeared around Tokuse, now standing, before Kobamu materialized alongside him. Normally I don't take people with me, but since you don't know anything about your quirk, you deserve to know. Tokusei explained as he stepped forwards. Thank you, detective. Tokusei examined the quirk in the center of the void. Pale red and a dodecahedron in shape. Barrier. Manifested in Kurai Kobamu, age 22, on June 7, 2179. Type, emitter. Allows the holder to create a protective barrier around themselves. Whoa, it's amazing. Kobamu marveled. Nothing like my parents. Their quirks are igloo and lightning breath. There's hints, the dome shape from igloo, energy basis from lightning breath, but it's still very different. Tokuse mused, before looking up. No junk data, just like a quirkless person. What does that mean? It means you didn't get this quirk naturally. Tokuse answered. I need to go back. Reversing a full year, Tokuse found an empty void, just darkness around him and Kobamu. This is exactly what I see when I use my quirk on someone who's quirkless. Tokuse mused. It's impossible. The only way is if I was given a child's unmanifested quirk. Kobamu finished. But the merchant of quirks is just a myth, right? I'm not at liberty to answer that, Tokusei replied, before slowly winding time forward, towards the present, not letting his eyes off where the quirk would manifest. It appeared, still just a quirk spark, unmanifested. Finding the exact moment, Tokusei read the time on the display. April 14, 2179. 15 hours, 8 minutes and 9 seconds. Tokusei spoke in disbelief. That's impossible. That was during the USJ attack, that was. Tokusei cut himself off, before releasing quirk space, returning to the real world. Standing, Tokusei moved to the door. I need to speak with you privately, Sukachi. Ignoring Kobamu's protests for an explanation, Tokusei led his colleague to an unoccupied room, free of anyone or anything that could listen in. It's a natural quirk, I don't know how, but it is. Tokusei spoke as he drew his datapad, searching through the archives. I thought it might be that FO gave him a child's unmanifested quirk. But when AFO gives or takes quirks, they appear through this tear he makes in the void. Sukachi nodded along, following the explanation. There was no tear then. No, Kobama was 100% quirkless, and then he suddenly had an unmanifested quirk. Tokusei continued. But the time it appeared it was during the USJ attack, at this exact moment. Tokusei held out his datapad, showing a snippet of surveillance footage that had survived. Taking the datapad, Sukachi examined the scene. He could see All Might, Midoriya and his fellow students surrounding Shigaraki, Kurajiri and the Namu that they had in custody. Sukachi could see Kobamu, standing on a fake mountain, looking down at the stalemate below him. Sukachi pressed play. Midoriya started to glow, multicolored light enshrouding his body. This was when Midoriya transferred some of One for All's power to Tashinori. Sukachi mused. Keep watching. Tokusei urged. Sukachi kept his eyes on the recording as All Might was covered in the same glow as Midori. The light surrounding both of them began to fade, before a pulse shot out, forming a dome of light moving in every direction, passing harmlessly over everyone around Midori. In the recording, Kobamu was struck by the energy, falling backwards, unconscious, the only one to be affected by the energy. It's one for all. Sukachi breathed. One for all gave Kobamu a quirk. Tokusei nodded. We need to tell All Might about this. Nedzu too. Sukachi qualified. If anyone can make sense of this, he can. The 9th of June 2179. I had my suspicions, but this confirms them. Nedzu spoke calmly, sat in his chair at the conference table. Joining him were All Might, Sir Nidai, Recovery Girl, Sukachi and Shikaku. I have been noticing a pattern at certain events, all of them involving situations where the one for all user is forced to use a large portion of their stockpiled energy to defeat a foe. Nedzu continued. The USJ attack, All Might's battle with AFO on Dagoba, Nana's final stand. Nedzu pressed a button, changing the screen to show three separate maps, showing the locations of each of three locations he just mentioned. After each event, a small number of quirkless individuals, those closest to the epicenter, gain quirks. Nedzu explained, red dots on each map showing the epicenter and orange dots for those who had gained quirks. How is this possible? Might I questioned. One for all is a stockpile of energy that can be passed on, it doesn't grant others quirks. I have a theory, Nedzu stated calmly. As you all know, the first known quirked individual was the luminescent baby, in China. This was followed by sudden quirk manifestations in the hospital, not newborns, but from every age, young and old. It's a popular theory that the luminescent baby triggered global quirk manifestation. Recovery Girl noted, 
It is, but I propose something else. Nedzu countered, 23 years after the first quirk, random quirk manifestations ceased entirely. Thus the only way to have a quirk after that was to be born with one. All Might leaned back in his chair. You're suggesting the luminescent baby was the first one for all user. That I am. Nedzu nodded. I believe that all for one gave his brother the stockpiling quirk so he would no longer create quirks and all those he came into contact with. So one for all stockpiles pure quirk energy. All Might mused, looking down at his withered hand. I doubt he did it out of the goodness of his heart. Gran Torino commented. Then again, free quirks for all would somewhat undermine his business model. Nedzu cleared his throat. Earlier today scanners picked up two more energy waves, the same as the ones seen at the other events. The screen changed again, showing a map of Yokohama. I haven't been near Yokohama. Izuku is still in a coma and young Ada hasn't left campus in over a week. All Might explained. Then that implies that there is another user of One for All out there. Might I noted, in a manner of speaking. We believe that All for One is attempting to replicate One for All via Izuku's DNA. From the no doubt numerous samples he took whilst the boy was his captive, Medzu continued, We have managed to pinpoint the location thanks to Detective Shikaku. He found the exact time at which the three individuals known to have manifested a quirk did so. You used the exact time and assumed the quirk gifted energy wave moves at a constant speed, hence, the epicenter. Might I noted that we did. Nedzu changed the screen again, showing a manor home. The residence of one Batai, the great-granddaughter of all for one and she has abducted one of my students, young Minta, from 1A, her own child. So are we going to raid the facility? Might I queried, to shut down all for one's operations? All Might nodded. We are, and to rescue young Minta, but there are some complications. Izuku Midoriya was taken off life support earlier today. His brain is fully healed. He should have woken up by now, but he hasn't. Recovery Girl explained. He believe whatever All for One is doing is keeping him from awakening. Fran Torino croaked. Nedzu nodded. This is a map of Mustafu. An identical energy wave as the one from Yokohama was generated by Midoriya at the exact same moment. So, they're synchronized somehow. Night I pondered. Cloning. We believe that is the case. Nedzu answered. Four individuals so far have reported quirk manifestations, none of whom are UA students. The primary objectives of the mission are to destroy whatever device All for One is using to keep Izuku unconscious and to rescue young Maita. All Might informed. We will be using a team consisting mostly of UA faculty and a few trustworthy heroes. Atsuro Badai is a high-ranking official in the HPSC. Who cannot know of the raid ahead of time, she will surely find out if they do. Looks like we've got some hard work ahead of us then. Gran Torino groused. The elderly hero could feel it in his bones. The winds had changed. Events were spiraling closer and closer to their resolution. Whether said resolution was to be good or disastrous remained to be seen. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that the passing there had warned them really about the same. Two roads diverged in a wood. And I, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. Robert Frost. 1915. That's mean, Kakin. Can't you see he's crying? If you keep going, I I'll never forgive you. Can I be a hero, too? I'm sorry, Izuku. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go take a swan dive off the roof of the building. Young man, you too can be a hero. The power of one for all caused your quirk to mutate. It strengthened it. It's over, Shigaraki, you've lost. All you came here to do today was kill and destroy. You fight for nothing and no one but yourself. You lack resolve. You could have left the girl behind and escaped by now. Did you even think of all the lives you could have saved in the future if you just abandoned this hopeless waif? I'm in Risteria. I'm in a fantasy world. I love you. Quirksmith hero, Hinode. Home, the long way round. Izuku Midoriya was cold. Every breath he drew chilled his lungs, as if it was attempting to lure him back into the abyss of nothingness he'd just escaped from. A sudden jerk roused Izuku, his eyes snapping open to reveal he was in one of Yujiko's cryogenic chambers, tilted backwards and being wheeled along. Izuku tried to peer through the frosted glass in front of him, only able to pick out the occasional light fixture in what he assumed was the ceiling. Reaching inside himself, Izuku attempted to pull on explosion to grant him Bakugo's confidence so he could think up a way to escape. Nothing happened. Izuku's breath began to quicken, the confined space reminding him of the time Tenso Fukai and his cronies had locked him in one of Aldera's store cupboards with the light off. Izuku had been in there for hours until a teacher had found him while looking for a new marker pen. No one had even realized he was missing. No one had known where he was. And now no one knew where he was again. This time there were no teachers to stumble across him. He was alone, at the mercy of all for one and his cronies. Izuku could feel himself hyperventilating. He couldn't move his body. He couldn't even scream. I'll find you. 
I'll save you, Uri. Izuku's fingers twitched, his own words reverberating around his mind. I promise I'll rescue you, and Hino doesn't break his promises. Izuku could move again, but resisted the urge to do so before he could think. Looking down at his clothes, Izuku was glad to find he was wearing some and not going to end up having to enact an unwilling Terminator cosplay. Izuku was wearing a short-sleeved black compression top with matching black armored trousers and boots. His forearms were covered by fingerless gloves that went almost up to his elbows. However, the most striking detail was the red lines spread across the entire outfit, mimicking those of his hero costume. Clearly whoever had dressed him had wanted him to look like some dark mirror of his hero costume. Focusing on the glass again. Izuku caught sight of the reflection of his own face. He could see his familiar green eyes, contrasted by long white hair hanging to his shoulders and a black metal mouthguard over the bottom half of his face, the design of it modeled after the one from his costume beta. Reaching a hand up, Izuku felt the cold metal over his mouth. Moving his fingers behind his ear, he felt a switch, which he quickly pressed. The mask retracted into itself, leaving just the sections over his cheekbones. Now he could properly see his face, except it wasn't his face. Izuku recognized the general bone structure, but he was missing his freckles. It was the face of Jusengata, the clone that all for one had transplanted Izuku's heart into, to create an organ bank he could use infinitely. But now Izuku could see that all for one had lied. Jusengata wasn't a clone of Izuku's father, but of Izuku's uncle, Yoichi Shigaraki, was all for one trying to bring him back somehow. Or was this part of some convoluted attempt to get hold of one for all? Izuku shook his head. He could think about that later. First he had to escape and before that he needed to see what he was working with, in addition to the mild regenerative abilities the transplant of his original heart had granted him. Taking deep breaths, Izuku began to calm himself and ease his way into a meditative state. Focusing on the feeling of entering his quirk space, Izuku tried to replicate it, without having access to its namesake quirk. Opening his eyes, Izuku found himself in the familiar dark void stretching out around him in every direction. One for all thrummed reassuringly in the center of the void. Alone, his other quirks were gone. Quirksmith. All those he'd copied, the ones all for one had forced upon him. And then Izuku caught something out of the corner of his eye. A quirk, but not one that had manifested yet. It was the natural quirk of the clone body Izuku now inhabited. Without a prior consciousness, the quirk had never had a trigger to manifest. I guess that answers that question I asked Tokusei. The mind influences that quirk, without it, there is no quirk. Izuku sighed. He had hoped that since he had the heart of his original body then he may have access to quirksmith or a copy of it. Instead he just had one for all. Izuku was pretty sure a heart transplant counted as DNA transfer, explaining how it had managed to follow Izuku's consciousness to the clone body. Tentatively probing one for all, Izuku could tell it was only at 30%, the 60% he had was split between this body and the original, a bond, a genetic link. Izuku turned to face the unmanifest quirk, an idea forming in his mind, forced manifestation, a quirk he could shape into exactly what he needed. Walking over to the unmanifested quirk, Izuku took a deep breath, trying to recreate the feeling of manipulating quirk data. Izuku's hand passed right through the quirk, as if it were just a projection. No, this has to work. I managed to replicate quirk space, why not quirksmith? But deep down Izuku knew it wasn't possible. Accessing your own quirk space was about a state of mind. Altering a quirk took more than that. A glow from behind Izuku made him turn around, revealing that one for all had turned into a doorway, heavy dark wood with a solid stone frame. It reminded Izuku of an old English church, or something out of Risteria. Tentatively, Izuku reached out and opened the door to show a non agonal room, in the same style as the doorway. Stepping inside, Izuku jumped as the door slammed closed behind him. Breathing heavily, Izuku gave himself time to recover before he moved to the center of the room, finding that each of its nine sides had a doorway, including the one he'd just come from. Above each door was a number in Roman numerals, counting from one, the door he'd entered through, to nine. The eighth door was slightly ajar. Creeping forwards, Izuku slowly opened it, bathing himself in a warm yellow light. Hello, Izuku blinked, his eyes adjusting to the light to find a modern apartment, not too dissimilar to his own home. Sat in an armchair was a figure of pure yellow energy, without any distinguishing facial features, but Izuku recognized him immediately. All might. Rushing forwards, Izuku reached out to touch his mentor, but like with the unmanifested quirk before, his hand sailed through him. Izuku raised his voice. All might. Mr. Yagi. Yagi. Still nothing. Izuku felt his frustration rising. Dad. The vestige of All Might jerked into consciousness, looking around himself, his movements sluggish as if he'd been asleep for a long time. Young Midoriya. All Might's vestige questioned, staring at the green-haired teen, young Midoriya. In an instant, Izuku found himself being hugged tightly by the vestige. The arms of twisted yellow light felt like they were about to snap him in two. It's such a relief to see you, Izuku. 
The vestige boomed, breaking apart to appraise Izuku for any damage. Or I suppose this is technically our first meeting. Izuku frowned, tilting his head. I am 8th, the vestige of Toshinori Yagi. Apologies for my bizarre appearance. How are you so different from your physical self? The other vestiges look. Normal. 8th chuckled. For me, every time Toshinori sleeps, I get all his memories from since he last slept. It's what keeps me looking like this. Izuku swallowed nervously. So once All Might dies, I'll look like he did in life. Eighth confirmed. Not immediately. But the longer you go without an update, as it were, the more normal you look, until after a while, you look the same from your physical self. Izuku's brain worked at top speed as he tried to process what Eighth had said. So that's why Seventh looked like her physical self because Nana was in stasis for years. Eighth took a step back. My master is alive. Yes, she is. Izuku exclaimed, realizing he hadn't told the vestige. All for one, he didn't kill her. Instead he put her body in stasis and her mind in this dreamscape. Do you remember Risteria? Risteria. Eighth mused, his blurred facial features still managing to convey that he was deep in thought. Wait, the fantasy world, with the swords? I thought that was just a fever dream. Izuku nodded enthusiastically. All for one created it as a place for the first holder to escape his illness but I kind of rebooted it as an actual real universe to get out. Eighth sat back down. That is a lot to take in. I'm relieved that she's alive. But all this time she suffered in his grip while I galvanted around. I should have gone back for her. Instead I let Gran Torino carry me away. You couldn't have known. From what she said the only reason she survived was because all for one used his healing quirks on her. Izuku explained. If you'd gone back, there's a good chance he might not have done that at all. You're right, the past is just that. Eighth declared, leaping to his feet, his demeanor suddenly shifting. Now, on with how you are here. I was trying to use Quirksmith, but I'm in a clone body with only access to one for all in an unmanifested quirk, and in the clutches of all for one. Eighth finished. One for all brought me up to speed. It can do that. If you're a vestige it can. Eighth shrugged, before walking past Izuku and into the main room. Follow me. Izuku jumped to, jogging after the vestige to match his massive strides. Do you know what this is, young Izuku? Eighth queried, gesturing to the doors around them. Izuku frowned. Is this a manifestation of one for all, where the vestige is live? It is, but it's more than that. Eighth answered, studying Eighth intently. Izuku was starting to form a new theory on one for all vestiges. A hive mind, while the individual vestiges retained their memories and personalities. It was clear right now that this was one for all speaking directly to him through Eighth. This place is not just a stockpile of vestiges who have possessed one for all, but a stockpile for the copies of their quirks. Eighth intoned, copies of their quirks, but one for all can't copy quirks. Eighth chuckled, it can, but only the natural quirks of its wielders, recreated using one for all's raw quirk energy. Raw quirk energy, Eighth suddenly shifted, resembling an older version of the clone body Izuku was inhabiting. First, in the vestige, nephew, first replied with a wry smile. I'm afraid my successors didn't manage to pass on the true nature of my original meta ability. Izuku remained silent, hanging on first's every word. My original quirk, as you would call, I named Promethean. First continued. A quirk with ability to create quirks. First paused. Quirks have existed for far longer than the world knows, for millennia longer. They did. Every culture has myths of gods and miracles. First answered. As time passed, each of the bloodlines learned to hide, operating in the shadows instead of the light. Izuku frowned. But surely over the generations the quirks would have become too prevalent to hide. No, back then, quirks only appeared once in every generation. If the holder was killed without any heirs, it passed on to a relative in the same generation and then to their heirs. You said your quirk was originally Promethean. Izuku spoke, realization dawning on his face. As in Prometheus who stole fire from the gods and gave it to the humans. First nodded. I did. In Destro's manifesto, in Metal Liberation War, he refers to the luminescent baby as the Promethean child. Izuku reasoned. He was referring to you. You're the luminescent baby, but you can't be. Every book I've read stated that the luminescent baby was a girl. First shrugged. That was how I was born. My parents never understood. Always waited, hoping I would grow out of it. I never did. But at least I had my brother. Kaishi always supported me. Through that, my quirk illness, the meta riots. Everything. Izuku watched first, seeing the wistful look on his face fade to sadness. Until he didn't. Opening his mouth to speak, Izuku felt the words die in his throat. My quirk, upon my birth, released a shockwave of raw quirk energy that gave those around me quirks and fundamentally altered quirk inheritance, and so dawned the age of quirks. First side. We had to move after I was born. Go into hiding back in Japan. New names. I wasn't allowed out of the house because my parents were afraid it would happen again. I wasn't allowed to go to school with my brothers. Izuku looked down. So when all for one forced the stockpiling quirk on you, he didn't. Silence echoed through the room. 
Kaishi didn't force the stockpiling quirk onto me. It was a quirk that belonged to an elderly woman. She was frail. Every time she used it she was injured by it. First explained. She gave it up willingly. And Kaishi gave it to me so I could have the strength to keep fighting my illness. What was your illness? Izuku blurted out. Before blushing in embarrassment at the insensitive question. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have. First chuckled. It's fine, really. It's fine. My illness was a side effect of my quirk. My body was always producing a small amount of quirk energy, produced from breaking down lipids and muscle mass. I couldn't stop it. You couldn't build your lipid stores or muscle mass faster than Promethean used it up. Izuku realized. Correct. That's why Kaishi found me that quirk. Instead of burning through my body, I could use the kinetic energy that stockpile generated, first affirmed, and thus began the feedback loop that created one for all. So that's how one for all works. Stockpile feeds kinetic energy to Promethean, which converts it into quirk energy, which strengthens stockpile so it can store and produce more kinetic energy. Izuku mumbled to himself, hence why one for all gets stronger the more it's used, not just the more times it's passed on. Wait, if your original quirk wasn't a quirk that allowed for itself to be passed on, then how can one for all be passed on? It's due to the interaction between Promethean and Stockpile. The latter can manipulate kinetic energy so when they synergize the resultant quirk could now manipulate the quirk energy it created. First answered, essentially, when one for all is passed on, the current holder's copy is burnt up to create the new holder's copy, leaving just a stockpile of kinetic energy that will deplete over time. Izuku stroked his chin, his mind thick with ideas for how he could apply this new information to how he used one for all. Wait, so when one for all transfers to the new holder it also copies the data for the holder's own quirk? Right. Just the data, not the actual quirk itself. First nodded. One for all has reached singularity. Never before have four bodies possessed it at the same time. Finally enough quirk energy is being generated to recreate the predecessor's quirks from the data one for all copies during the transfer. And since they're contained within one for all, then that dampening quirk will have no effect on them. Izuku mused. You were trying to edit that unrealized quirk and force manifest it, weren't you? First question rhetorically. And since this version of one for all is technically a copy of the version possessed by the ten, Izuku turned to face the ninth door. Then that means this version of one for all must contain a copy of Quirksmith. Upon the words leaving Izuku's lips the doors swung open, revealing his bedroom, and in the center of it was Quirksmith. The quirk was smaller than he remembered, but the familiar energy it gave off comforted him. Izuku looked back over his shoulder. Think why? First was gone. Huh. Izuku turned his focus back to Quirksmith, reaching out and touching it. He could immediately tell it wasn't as powerful as his own version, only capable of copying quirks for a few minutes instead of permanently, but the ability to edit quirks was still there. Closing his eyes, Izuku plunged his hand into the quirk and held it there for a few seconds before pulling it out. Red energy coated his hand like a glove. Let's get to work. Heading back into the main room, Izuku returned to his quirk space via the first door and approached the unmanifested quirk. Reaching out, Izuku pinched his finger and thumb, grasping a strand of junk data from the void above his head where it all floated. Busying himself, Izuku began to edit the strand, adding and removing quirk nodes as needed, before grafting both ends to the unmanifested quirk. Taking a step back, Izuku took in his handiwork for a few moments before charging quirk energy from one for all in his other hand. I hope this works. Izuku's hand slammed into the unmanifested quirk, pouring quirk energy into it, feeding it the fuel it needed to become realized. An explosion of pale light knocked Izuku off his feet, hitting what passed for the ground in quirk space awkwardly. Hissing in pain that Izuku knew wasn't technically real, he looked to the quirk that it had grown in size, taking on a silver hue. Heart link allows the holder to use the quirks of anyone whose heart they possess. Izuku recited to himself, instinctively knowing the intricate details of the quirk without even having to touch it. It had worked just as Izuku had intended. It was a masterpiece considering he'd done it in five minutes. He had made sure the definition of heart was purely anatomical. And now he just had to hope the quirk had listened to him. And since this body had been implanted with the heart from his original body, touching heart link, Izuku suddenly felt a tidal wave of energy rushing over him. Blinking, Izuku saw a single green strand of energy leading inside the quirk as it seemed to open like a portal. Affirming his conviction, Izuku plunged his hand into the portal. Blinking, Izuku found himself in his quirk space once again, except not the quirk space of the body he was currently in, instead the one of his original body. One for all and quirksmith floated together in the center, surrounded by his remaining quirks, those all for one hadn't bothered to take from him. It worked, I did it. Izuku breathed a sigh of relief. Heart Link had created a link between the two quirk spaces via the implanted heart. Thus, he could use all the quirks contained in his original body and his cloned one. Izuku raised his hand towards two dark red and black quirks, quickly scanning them both. 
the suppression and self-destruction quirks. The first was easy to understand, after all its function and modifications had been explained to him by all for one. On the other hand, the second quirk was a little more difficult to fully understand. It appeared to be some kind of medical quirk at its core, related to resuscitation. Now it had been keyed to target and suppress Izuku's consciousness, resorting to triggering a cardiac arrest if he managed to bypass the suppression. Fortunately, neither quirk was capable of affecting the body he was currently inhabiting despite the linked quirk spaces. They'll have to wait for now, Izuku stated. He would be able to use his current body to unravel those quirks once he could make physical contact with his proper body, and then return his consciousness to that body. Izuku took a deep breath. Before he could do any of that he had a breakout to stage. Izuku made his selections, choosing just 10 quirks to mitigate the strain on his body, just as he learned in Risteria. Activating Heart Link the quirk space vanished with a swirl of multicolored light and Izuku traveled back to the quirk space he'd come from. For a few seconds, nothing happened, before 10 quirks blazed into existence, forming a ring around one for all, a beam of energy connecting each of them back to it, holding his hand out to touch one of them. Izuku's appendage passed straight through. That confirmed his theory. Heart Link was only copying the quirk temporarily, not actually transferring it to this quirk space. I can do this. Izuku opened his eyes and breathed condensation onto the glass front of the chamber, focusing on the muffled voices outside the chamber. Izuku strained to hear what they were saying. Met the new guy yet? Nah, heard about him though. Kinda unstable apparently, contradicts himself all the time. Yeah, goes by twice. According to Medusa, he's the guy we've got to thank for not ending up in Tartarus. Made copies of us for the police to arrest. The boss man even gave him a quirk to make the copies more convincing. Would you two cram it? We gotta get this package into deep freeze before it wakes. I hate these mindless freaks. They just stare and scream. Yeah, yeah, we get it Stonehenge. You're jealous the boss man didn't give you a quirk like he did to the new guy. The fuck did you say to me? Izuku and the chamber he was inside came to a halt as a physical altercation started, Stonehenge batting one of the other villains into the wall effortlessly. However, Izuku paid it no attention, instead trying to recall where he remembered that name from. Stonehenge, Izuku murmured to himself as the face of one of the villains smacked into the glass, sliding downwards as he collapsed into unconsciousness. And then it came to him, the USJ incident, which meant all for one had replaced some, if not all, of the villains who had escaped during the breakout on the day of the sports festival. In short, there were dangerous villains out on the streets that the heroes and police had no way of knowing were not in Tartarus. Then Izuku knew what he had to do. Activating one of his ten quirks, Izuku's breath turned first to steam and then to smoke. A gout of orange flames burst from the chamber, spraying shards of glass in every direction. It's awake. Izuku dropped to the floor, landing on one knee, steam rising all around him. Looking up, Izuku found himself surrounded by familiar foes, an assortment of the same low-level villains that had attacked the USJ as he previously surmised. Glancing at one of the shards of glass, Izuku glimpsed two more villains behind him that had been in charge of pulling the chamber, making for eight in total, however two of their number were already taken care of by the infighting. Wasting no time, Izuku activated overhaul and pressed his palm to the concrete floor below. In an instant all eight villains were encased in concrete shooting up from the floor, leaving just their faces free. For a moment Izuku thought the fight might have been over before it started, but he was proved wrong when three of the villains broke their bonds. Stonehenge, Restrain, Mask, each of them had enhanced strength. Stonehenge with his additional arms and rock-covered skin. Restrain got stronger the more he was restrained, hence the straight jacket. Mask's strength increased the more oxygen concentration the air he breathed in had. A powerful trio, but still no match for one for all. Charging up a 30% smash, the maximum of Izuku's current body now the quirk was split with both Ida and his original body. He turned his forearm to diamond, using slingshot to push off at high speed. Izuku slammed his fist into Stonehenge's chest as the villain raised all four of his arms to block. Izuku rebounded, hitting the floor and rolling to a stop. Okay, Stonehenge might need a little more than just punching really hard. Izuku mumbled to himself as he stood up, before noticing an odd lack of pain. But in this body, using 30% of my power, it didn't hurt me at all. Stonehenge growled at the mention of his name and charged. Leaping over the villain, Izuku formulated a new plan, to take out the two weaker villains and then focus on Stonehenge, pushing off the wall at blinding speed. Izuku wrapped his fingers around Mask's breathing apparatus and pulled, ripping it clean off. The masked villain dropped to the floor, coughing and wheezing as his body shrank from muscled to frail almost instantly. Turning his attention to restrain, Izuku grabbed at the villain's straight jacket. A fist suddenly slammed into Izuku's side, sending him through a wall and into a large darkened room. 
The teen hero stared up from the floor, seeing the room was filled with rows of chambers, numbering in the hundreds, just like the one Izuku had been in. Stonehenge stepped through the hole he had made in the wall, his immense size widening it further. So you're All Might's little protege. Stonehenge sneered, lifting a limp Izuku up by the scruff of his collar. The boss said if you woke up in this body we were to subdue you, but Stonehenge's grip tightened. Well, let's just say I'm going to do what I enjoy instead, making All Might suffer, and your death will be such delicious suffering. The villain snarled. By the way, Stonehenge is no more, I am Steel Bulwark. Izuku couldn't help but start laughing. Steel Bulwark, you're made of rocks, why are you so bad at names? Stonehenge snarled, shaking Izuku violently. Don't you dare mock me, I will make Steel Bulwark a name that will fill all might, my nemesis, with dread at the barest whisper of it, dropping his pretense. Izuku straightened up and jammed his hand into Stonehenge's mouth. He doesn't even know who you are. Izuku activated discharge digits. Stonehenge howled, the noise muffled by Izuku's hand, for a few seconds before collapsing with a crash that knocked over the chambers around them. Extricating himself from the unconscious villain, Izuku stood and turned to face Restrain, who was still standing in the corridor, beyond the hole his compatriot had created. This is the part where you can feel free to surrender. Wriggling in his straitjacket for a few seconds, it dropped to the floor, leaving Restrain free and his quirk deactivated. Izuku let him run, bending over with his hands on his knees to catch his breath as soon as the villain was out of sight. This cloned body didn't have the same insane endurance Izuku had built up to be able to use one for all without entirely blowing his limbs up. Izuku looked down at his hand. And yet I can use one for all better with it than I can with my own body. All for one, are you Jiko? Must have altered it during creation to be able to withstand those kinds of forces. Still miss my proper body. Izuku sighed, straightening up and preparing to head in the same direction as Restrain had gone. The sound of glass crunching underfoot reached Izuku's ears, and then the next thing he knew he was tackled by a Namu, smaller than the previous he'd seen, with grey skin that dripped clay, exactly like the Namu he'd fought in Risteria. Izuku felt the clay arms of the Namu reshape, forming bonds around his body, but with a quick burst of one for all he broke free and launched himself at the Namu. His hand made contact with the Namu's head, Izuku calling on quirk space to enter the being's void, but nothing happened. The Namu had no quirk space to enter, meaning one thing, it was a non-sentient copy created using a quirk, just like the Namu of Risteria. Izuku tightened his grip around the Namu's head, green lightning crackling around his fingers until the clay gave way. The Namu began to dissolve. The viscous clay, similar in consistency to slip, was no longer able to hold its form. Izuku breathed a sigh of relief, before the glint of metal caught his eye, reaching into the remains of the Namu. Izuku retrieved a small metal device. Its surface was uniform except for a red light that flashed every few seconds, in time with a low beep. It was clearly some kind of tracker, making Izuku wonder if all Namu were implanted with such a device. Except that couldn't be the case. The shock absorption Namu from the USJ attack was still in custody. If it was implanted with a tracker like this then Kirajiri could have retrieved it like he did with the other two, crushing the tracker in his grip. Izuku let the sparking remains drop to the floor, sinking into the clay that now coated the concrete surface. Walking over to the chamber Stonehenge had knocked over when he'd fallen unconscious Izuku checked each in turn. Apart from a single empty chamber the others contained the liquidized remains of their occupants, meaning all Namu that had been disturbed were accounted for, one way or another. The bang sounded from behind Izuku, making him spin around in time to see the chamber nearest to the Namu he'd destroyed open. Looking down, Izuku saw the clay from the destroyed Namu had seeped under the chamber, short-circuiting the electrical, dropping into a stance. Izuku called upon creation, using it to produce a sadly non-magical replica of Hinode in his grip. The Namu that had been released from its chamber screeched incomprehensibly, before charging at the green-haired teen. With a spin, Izuku blocked the Namu's arm and sliced its head off in a single motion, just as Tenra had taught him. The beheaded Namu staggered forwards, directly into a line of untouched chambers, knocking them over as it fell on them. Izuku watched with a sense of sinking realization as chamber after chamber fell like dominoes, releasing their occupants. I have a bad feeling about this. The hilt of a broken sword clattered through the whole stone henge had made in the wall, the grip slick with a layer of wet clay. Izuku groaned as he pulled himself over the small ledge of wall that remained, following the remains of his sword, the rest of it buried somewhere in a giant mound of clay. His clothes were streaked with clay and his own blood, the latter from the litany of cuts and bruises that adorned his body, the worst of which came from one of the Namu's claws. It had sliced deep into his shoulder as Izuku had destroyed it, but at least they were healing, albeit slowly. He would be as good as new in an hour or so. The worst part was the exhaustion. This body had none of the stamina that All Might had trained into him. Izuku tried to stand, but his feet slipped in the wet clay that coated the soles of his sneakers and he slammed back down into the concrete floor, 
Got to keep moving. Izuku grunted as he tried again, only to receive the same result, hitting the floor with a wet smack, and this time he didn't have the strength to try again. Exhaustion took him, but Izuku didn't dream. A whirlwind of color swallowed him and he felt himself falling. Izuku hit the ground, landing in a clumsy and definitely ungraceful crouch. Looking down at himself he stared at his own hands. They, and the rest of his body, were made of green energy, just like Aeth had been. And then they weren't. Stabilizing into a translucent form of his body, the cloned body, his outline glowing with green light. Again, Izuku stood, finally taking in his surroundings. He was in gym beta. Yes, Sensei Torino. Drenched in sweat, Ada was dressed in his UA gym gear and stood in front of a block of concrete. Ada released a shout, launching a kick at the concrete without the use of his quirk. His padded shin bounced of unforgiving mass, leaving it unblemished. Izuku turned his head, taking in the sight of an elderly man wearing a hero costume he didn't recognize. Based on the stories Nana had told Izuku, he assumed the man to be Gran Torino, although he was somewhat shorter than she'd described him. Ada was trying to summon one for all's power under Gran Torino's tutelage and so far, not succeeding. The energy that made up Izuku's current form, clearly invisible to Ada and Gran Torino, pulsed rhythmically. Probing the energy, Izuku's surroundings changed. He could see his own body, his original body, lying in a hospital bed. Holding the other Izuku's remaining hand was Yagi. His head stooped, looking even more deflated than he usually did in his natural form. Izuku had seen enough. Perhaps if he accessed that energy he'd felt again it would take him back to his body, the clung body that was. Gritting his teeth, Izuku reached into the energy and forced himself through a barrier, dimly realizing as he did that it was constructed with the now familiar energy signature of all for one. Nana was in a fighting stance. A chamber lay ruined behind her, shards of glass scattered around her. Activating float, Nana pushed off into the air, avoiding the villain's prehensile hair. Twisting in midair, Nana cancelled her quirk and dropped towards the ground bringing her foot down on the villain's back. Nana knocked her to the floor, before subduing her by slamming her face back down into the concrete. The final villain, this one with four arms, turned to run, making it halfway down the corridor. Nana raised her arm, revealing it was colored dark navy, akin to the shock absorption Namo. In an instant Nana's namuified arm stretched out, grabbing the fleeing and smacking him into the wall. With a sigh, Nana released the subdued villain and retracted her arm, examining it as she did. What did all for one do to you? Nana pondered, poking her navy-colored, the skin rippling like the surface of water. Nana, Izuku spoke, his voice sounding oddly distant, even to himself. Nana jumped and turned around. You startled me, good, you're awake. The pro-hero frowned. Wait, astral projection. Guess it's good to know one for all can do that as well now. Izuku looked down at his translucent body. I think it's because we were in Risteria together. Maybe the after-effects of the quirk all for one used on us, combined with the power of one for all. But I could be wrong. There's so many other reasons why it. Don't second-guess yourself. You've got pretty good instincts for someone your age. Don't be afraid to trust them. Nana assured him. Now, if your theory is correct, can you project yourself to Iri as well? See where she is. Izuku focused, trying to focus on Iri as much as he could. I can feel it, but the connection is a lot weaker, and it's fading fast. Nana placed her hand on Izuku's translucent shoulder. You can do this, I believe in you. Izuku redoubled his efforts, his head pounding like a drum as he grasped at the fraying link. And then his surroundings shifted. He was in another underground facility, the air noticeably warmer than his own. In a chamber in front of him was Uri, once again placed in a deep sleep. I promise I'll rescue you. Izuku swore, placing his ethereal hand on the glass. No matter the cost. Turning, Izuku saw all for one, his mask covering his face, talking to a woman who looked oddly familiar. Her hair was the exact same shade of purple as Minta's spheres. Has the transfer been completed? All for one questioned. The woman nodded. Midoriya has been transferred to the northern facility. Shimura to the western facility. Both have been placed in deep cryofreeze. And the preparations for Operation Hamelin. All for one questioned. Complete. All we need is your signal to commence. The woman affirmed. Excellent. I will inform you when I wish to commence, Utsuro. But first, all for one looked directly at Izuku. The connection snapped, leaving Izuku back with Nana in what he now knew to be the western facility. I don't know exactly where he is, but it's south of me and east of you. Izuku explained, glancing down to realize his connection to Nana was beginning to fade, his projected form with it. There was someone else there, with all for one, he called her Atsuro. Purple hair, haughty. Izuku nodded. But Surobotai, she attended UA at the same time as Toshi, a year above, in the business stream. Nana explained, joined the HPSC straight after she graduated. I think she's Minda's mother. Izuku spoke, which would make her the great-granddaughter of all for one. And more importantly, her mansion in Yokohama, that's where Iri is if both Badai and All for One are there. Nana gave a curt nod. We don't have much time. We need to rendezvous at UA. We can come up with a plan there. 
Okay. Izuku paused. Stay safe. A wan smile formed on Nana's face. Don't worry, I've been dead once. I have no intention of doing it again anytime soon if I can help it. I dread to think about how many unread emails have piled up by now. Izuku snapped back to his own body, slumped in the corridor amongst the rubble. With a yell, Izuku pushed himself to his knees and then his feet. Got. Two. Save. Three. The green-haired teen forced himself to put one leg in front of the other, using the wall for support. Taking stock, Izuku could see his earlier injuries had healed, meaning he'd been out for at least an hour. But that hadn't helped the exhaustion. All he wanted to do was sleep, but he couldn't. A sudden shout grabbed Izuku's attention, looking up to see another villain charging at him. Reacting instantly, Izuku slammed his hand down on the wall, a hand forming from the concrete and capturing the charging villain before he could get too close. Izuku hissed, rolling up his sleeve to reveal an angry rash of hives, just like the one he'd seen over Hallgat. This must be the drawback of his quirk. Izuku mused. I wonder if this might work. Amplifying the passive healing quirk still in his original body with one for all, Izuku watched as the hives began to rapidly heal. If all for one was intending to use this body to gain one for all, then why was he putting it in cryfreeze? Izuku groaned as the realization hit him, he'd been played. All for one never intended to use this body. It was just bait to separate me from my actual body, that's what he's after. Izuku turned the corner, now feeling steady enough to leave the support of the wall behind. Staggering forwards, he found a pair of closed metal doors, light glimmering from the seam between them. With a grunt, Izuku forced the doors open and stumbled forwards, finding himself standing in a spruce forest that stretched as far as he could see. Resolving himself, Izuku stared out at the forest, trying to search for any obvious signs of nearby civilization. A car horn sounded in the distance. I guess I'm hiking. Izuku sighed, pulling his arms tighter around himself in an attempt to ward off the morning chill. Before Izuku could take his first step, a portal opened and from it stepped all for one into Mira Shigaraki. The latter had a cape draped around his shoulders. Izuku dropped back, readying himself for a fight. The adrenaline response providing a surge of energy that took the edge of his exhaustion. I would have let you live, you know. All for one side. I would have let you have your pick of quirks. After my plan was complete of course, I would have given you Riri. But you just can't help that sickness in you. You will try and you will fail. The worst thing you can do is nothing. Izuku replied, splitting his focus between all for one and an almost feral Tamira. How long did you spend in that world? The world my brother's mind created? All for one questioned. How long has it been for you since we last spoke? Days? Weeks? Months? Six months? Two weeks? Three days? You counted. All for one smirked. Yoichi was just the same. Tally marks on the prison walls. It helps to keep you sane. Izuku retorted. Risteria was not a prison. All for one argued. I made him a paradise. A pretty birdcage is still just a birdcage. Izuku countered. And you'd rather I'd let him suffer the agony of his illness, eating away at him every day. A painful truth is better than a beautiful lie. Izuku spoke. Did you even give him a choice, to enter Risteria willingly? Yoichi was too noble, he would have chosen to suffer. All for one side. So I had to make the choice for him, for his own good. The decision you made wasn't for him, you made it for yourself. Izuku glanced at Tamura, noticing he had some kind of prosthetic hand to replace the one he'd lost during the USJ incident. You are narrow-minded, Izuku. All for one snarled. I had thought we were of similar conviction, but alas. Tamura, you may have your fun. His true body is the one we want, not this one. I will defeat you. Izuku declared as all for one prepared to leave. I'll save Iri and stop you, even if you did, which is unlikely. All for one drawled. There will always be more who will take my place. With that, all for one stepped back into the portal as it shut, leaving Tamura behind. I've leveled up since our last fight. Tamura smirked. I don't need a Namu to help me anymore. I'll kill this boss all by myself. With blinding speed, Tamura lunged towards Izuku, his natural hand reaching out to decay anything it could touch, activating one for all. Izuku only just managed to dodge the hand and sped to the opposite side of the clearing, putting space between his foe and himself. The adrenaline wouldn't last forever. Izuku was fatigued starting this fight, he had to end it quickly. You've gotten slower, Tamura remarked, turning to face Izuku, just like All Might. Tamura blurred again, forcing Izuku to dodge, combining one for all speed with a single step to evade his foe. Izuku was now thoroughly on the back foot. I can't let Tamura get close without knowing what new quirks all for one has given him, and what that prosthetic hand can do as well. But before Izuku could evaluate the situation he again had to evade Tamura, the villain's hand decaying the ground Izuku had just vacated. You can't dodge me forever. Tamura snarled. You'll slip up eventually. Izuku made his choice, raising his arm and activating one for all, electrification and discharge digits. Parallel circuit, finger of Thor. A bolt of emerald green electricity shot from Izuku's fingertip as he flicked, aimed squarely at Tamura. 
the villain's chest suddenly turned to dust, forming a hole to allow the attack to pass harmless through, before reforming. That's new, Izuku remarked, having to dodge again. You beat me last time, humiliated me. This time, I'm going to kill you. Electrification. Discharge digits and rock hard are no use. Overhaul as well. If I'm close enough to use it, then he's close enough to use decay. You can't beat me. Tamura taunted. I am the ultimate creation. My quirks are in perfect synergy. Which quirk is the one that's given you a god complex? Or is that just something all for one taught you? Izuku retorted. With a howl of indignation Tamura closed the gap, hand reaching out for Izuku. A gout of flame burst from Izuku's mouth, striking Tamura's hand. In an instant, the villain's screams turned to that of pain before he retreated, nursing his scorched hand. You're not a perfect creation. If all for one thought you were he would have given you a regeneration quirk, wouldn't he have not? This only served to enrage Tamura further, the villain glaring at him as he placed his prosthetic to the ground. Dust whipped up into the air, creating a thick, obscuring cloud that enveloped Izuku entirely. I let you rile me up, bait me into attacking you, I won't make that mistake again. Tamura spoke, his voice seemingly coming from every direction all at once. A red light began to shine in the dust cloud. Izuku watched it get larger before a bolt of red energy shot at him. He didn't have time to dodge. Instead he turned his arms to diamond and blocked the laser fire, refracting it in every direction. Lowering his block, Izuku looked in every possible direction, searching for where Tamura might be now. Another laser bolt appeared from the darkness, striking Izuku on the back and knocking him off his feet. Groaning, Izuku clambered back to his feet only for yet another laser bolt to strike him, sending him slamming against the outside wall of the facility. Dropping into a crouch, Izuku dove wildly, only just evading the next laser blast. Sitting with his back against a tree, Izuku tried to get his breathing under control. There was a heavy pause, before four more blasts fired in rapid succession, striking different points in the clearing. Tamura had lost track of him. The dust wasn't only obscuring Izuku's vision, but that of its own creator. That meant all for one hadn't bothered to give his protege a quirk that could counter that drawback. Tamura roared with anger, giving his location away. Ever since you and that stupid quirk of yours showed up it's all Sensei has cared about. Placing his hand flat on the forest floor, Izuku activated overhaul, morphing the ground under Tamura's feet to launch him into the air. Pushing off from the tree, shattering its trunk, Izuku rocketed towards Tamura, his fist clenched, his weight carving the dust cloud open. The villain's eyes met his opponent's, his chest again turning to dust as Izuku closed in. Tamura had fallen right into Izuku's trap, opening his hand. Izuku placed his hand flat on Tamura's face as he sailed past, activating slingshot as he did. The villain froze in place, his eyes darting around wildly trying to find his opponent. Izuku shifted his body midair, pushing off and destroying another tree. Now coming from Tamura's back, the villain had no chance to use his dust form to evade the fist that drove into him. Opening his hand, Izuku released a massive explosion, sending himself flying backwards and Tamura forwards, building the potential energy of slingshot. Skidding as he landed, kicking up dust and leaves, Izuku activated one for all again, heaving the felled tree onto his shoulder with ease. Release. Izuku spoke through gritted teeth. Tamura shot backwards like he'd been fired from a cannon, smashing into the tree Izuku held aloft and then into the forest floor. Dazed, Tamura had no time to react before Izuku closed the gap, grabbing him by his cape and spinning him around into a tree. The clasp broke, sending Tamura flying, into another tree and then the ground, dirt filling his mouth. Spitting and coughing, Tamura rose into a crouch and pressed his hand against the tree, decaying it. Guided by his other hand, Tamura formed the dust into a spike and hardened it, before firing it at Izuku. Izuku raised his arms, turning them to diamond a moment before it struck, knocking him clean off his feet, rolling to a stop. Izuku groaned and looked down at his arms, seeing a spider's web of cracks running through the diamond. Tamura, looking worse for wear, appeared over Izuku, his hand reaching out and grasping his neck, leaving a single finger from touching. You will die and Sensei will forget all about you. Tamura hissed, pressing his final finger to Izuku's neck. Izuku blurred into an ink-like form, before vanishing inside Tamura. The void was dark, but not Izuku's own. It was like the whole plane was cast in shadow. Sniffles attracted Izuku's attention. The green-haired teen catching sight of a small boy, perhaps seven or eight, crying as he sat with his arms wrapped around his knees. The child had the same pale blue hair, the same red eyes. He was Tamura as a child. Hello, Izuku called, trying to get the boy's attention. Head snapping up, the boy's eyes filled with fear, desperately trying to crawl backwards. It's okay, it's okay. Izuku assured him. I'm a hero, I'm here to help. My father said heroes are only good for letting you down. The boy sniffled. Well I'm not going to let you down, I promise. I'm Hinode, but you can call me Izuku if you prefer. What's your name? Tenko. Izuku smiled. That's a lovely name. Do you remember how you got here, Tenko? Where you were before you were here? Tenko paused, before nodding. 
I was with him, the one with the red eyes like my mother's. Like me. What did the bad man do? Izuku queried, trying to keep his voice as soft and as calming as possible. He put his hand on my head. He told me he was going to give me a quirk, that I would make a perfect vessel for his son to be reborn into. His son? Izuku murmured. You mean Tamura? Tenko shivered, before nodding. He said Tamura wouldn't even remember he'd ever been anyone else. That he would inherit my memories. He would replace me. How old are you, Tenko? I don't know. Tenko answered. I was four when Sensei took me from my family. I tried to run home, so he killed my family, and my parents, my sister, my dog, and destroyed my home. He made me watch, told me it was my fault. That if hadn't tried to run he wouldn't have had to do it. Tenko broke into sobs, his chest heaving. Izuku moved forwards, hugging him. It's okay now. Izuku spoke. Because I am here. Izuku gave the most encouraging smile he could as Tenko gazed up at him, his sobs subsiding. Standing, Izuku stood, holding his hand out to Tenko. Let's get you out of here. Izuku stated. Tenko nodded, taking Izuku's hand and allowing himself to be pulled up. In an instant Tenko changed. No longer a small child but closer to 14 or 15, around the same age as Izuku himself. That was weird. Tenko remarked, looking down at himself. I was me, but as a child. Izuku hummed an affirmation. Your quirk was protecting you, instinctually, hiding your mind from all for ones. I mean, sensei's corruption as a memory, a stray vestige. You don't seem surprised. It's not the weirdest thing I've seen today. Izuku admitted as he approached the center of the quirk space. Not even top three if I'm honest. Where is this? Tenko questioned, examining a rather small quirk. It's light a brilliant red. Your quirk space. Izuku simply, earning himself a perplexed look from Tenko. I can copy quirks. I have quite a few now. One of which allows me to enter a visual manifestation of my quirk and the quirks of those I touch. Izuku answered, resting his palm on the center quirk, the largest by far. The quirk pulsed under Izuku's touch. Flight, manifested in Tenko Shimura, aged 4, on August 12, 2163. Type, emitter, allows the holder to cover themselves in an aerodynamic barrier, capable of protecting them from heat, cold, and physical harm. The barrier can also be used to enhance the user's strength and allow them unaided flight. Izuku's eyebrows vanished into his hairline. That's one powerful quirk, your natural quirk I presume. Tenko nodded. I couldn't turn it off when it first manifested. My dad had to use his quirk, float, to come up and get me. Float, Izuku murmured. And your name is Tenko Shimura. Again Tenko nodded, a slightly bemused look on his face. Your grandmother, paternal grandmother, she was a hero. Her name was Nana Shimura, wasn't it? Izuku queried. Yeah, she was. My father hated her, said she abandoned him to focus on her hero career. Tenko answered. Actually, she sent him away to protect him from all for one, or sensei as you know him. Izuku explained. What do you think happened to your grandfather? And how do you know all this? Izuku glanced over, his hand still resting on the quirk. Because she sent my mother away as well. Wait, your mother? Tenko questioned. That means, that means we're cousins. Exactly. Izuku muttered, turning his attention to a smaller red quirk. Laser, manifested in Tashiyuki Morikawa, age 17, on November 23, 2054, allows the holder to fire energy beams from their eyes. This doesn't make any sense. The sensei, I mean, all for one, he took that laser quirk from x less. Tenko spoke while staring up into the void. I know I've been out of it for a few years, but I'm pretty sure x less isn't over a hundred years old. No, I doubt he is. Izuku mused. Either x less was quirkless and all for one gave him that quirk. Or all for one lied to Shigaraki and kept x less's quirk for himself, palming a weaker, first or second generation quirk off on Shigaraki. What about the others? Tenko queried. Izuku nodded, before scanning each in turn. Lore, a speed enhancer, third generation. Dust devil, sand-based self-transformation, fourth generation. And the last one, decay. Izuku stated darkly, manifested in Tamura Shigaraki, aged 11, on April 1, 2042. Allows the user to turn anything they touch with all five digits to dust. That's the one, the first quirk that all for one forced on me. Tenko stated, his voice hollow. The manifestation date. That's from the first or second generation of quirk, but it's stronger than you'd expect from that era. Izuku muttered. It also means that Tamura Shigaraki is a vestige, a parasite, not a true consciousness. I want it gone. Tenko exclaimed, his eyes glowing red for a second. That's the quirk he used to kill my family. The quirk he used to turn my body into a monster and me a passenger forced to watch. Izuku gave Tenko his best, if somewhat shaky, smile. It's okay, I've got an idea. I know how to free you from Tamura Shigaraki. Please. Izuku nodded resolutely, desperately hoping his idea was even possible. 
After all, if one for all could deconstruct itself and then transfer to someone else, then why not the other quirks the holder possessed? Izuku held his hands out, shaped as if he was clutching a football, focusing intently on his target quirk, and then, with an almost anticlimactic pop, two becomes one came into existence within Tenko's quirk space. Tenko took a step back, an uneasy look on his face. You're like him, you can give and take quirks. Izuku panted from exertion, his hands on his knees. Not really, I can only give quirks I've copied not take them, and until now this was all just a theory I had in the back of my mind. Oh, Tenko seemed to deflate, clearly still overwhelmed by the current situation and unsure how to even begin to process any of it. Basically, this quirk allows the holder to turn their body into an intangible form and possess someone else. It's what I'm using right now, Izuku explained as he started modifying the quirk. But what I'm going to do is invert it. Instead of merging two bodies, I'm going to make it separate one body into two. They're going to use it to split me from Shigaraki. Izuku nodded. I am, it's the only way. But once I finalize my modifications that's when they'll take hold, and I'll be expelled out of here since the quirk I used to possess you no longer exists in that form. Tenko looked at Izuku nonplussed. Basically, once I'm done, I'll be pulled out of here. Activating the quirk and separating you from Tamura Shigaraki is all on you. Izuku simplified, inverting the trigger node and rewiring it into a different place in the quirk. Got it, I understand. Tenko paused. Isn't this all a bit cobbled together? Izuku shrugged. Sometimes you have to build your wings on the way down. Rig. Tenko suddenly collapsed to his knees, clutching his head as he cried out in pain. Izuku rushed to the other boy's side, reaching his hand out to touch Tenko's shoulder. Just before contact, a beam of red energy shot from the void and blasted Izuku off his feet, rolling to a stop. Izuku looked up to see Tamura Shigaraki loom out from the gloom, his eyes glowing red. Sensei said you would try and get inside my head. Shigaraki growled. I didn't think it would be so literal. Izuku clenched his fists and rocketed forwards, ready to deliver a punch directly to his opponent. A moment before impact, Shigaraki vanished and reappeared a distance away from Izuku. I don't have time for this. Shigaraki groused. Me neither. Izuku murmured as he looked down at his hands, seeing them start to fade away. Tenko, I can't keep him busy and alter the quirk at the same time. If I can't continue what I started, the quirk is going to fall apart. Tenko stood frozen. I can't, I can't fight that quirk. You have to, Izuku urged as he donned Shigaraki's grasp before breathing a gout of flame that forced the villain to take a few steps back. I believe you can do this. This is your body, not his. He's just a parasite that needs excising. Shigaraki chuckled, moving with blinding speed to place his hand on Izuku's chest, ready to decay. Time seemed to slow down. Izuku knew what he had to do. The only way to win was to not play. Izuku lowered his arms and adopted a neutral stance, awaiting Shigaraki's decay grip. The blue-haired teen watched in horror as the boy, his own age, his own cousin, resigned himself to his fate, decayed by the same quirk that had taken Tenko's whole family from him. He couldn't watch it happen again. Tenko moved before he could think. Twin beams of red energy struck Shigaraki's outstretched hand, burning it and forcing him to recoil away from Izuku. Wasting no time, Izuku dashed over to two becomes one, resuming his work moments before the quirk denature. No, no, you can't defy me. Shigaraki hissed as he stood. You can't take those quirks sensei gifted me away. The villain turned to face Tenko, who was trying his best to stay as calm as he could in the face of an older copy of himself whose mind had been slowly overwritten by a parasitic quirk. Hold him off as long as you can, Izuku instructed, working as fast as he could to alter the quirk in front of him. Tenko's eyes seemed to calm, his posture hardening. That won't be a problem. Firing laser again. Tenko blasted Shigaraki off his feet and sent him tumbling further away from Izuku. You're just a parasite, a quirk with thoughts, a quirk that was used to kill my entire family. Tenko stated, his voice unnervingly calm. But you're not just an unwilling tool, I've seen your thoughts, your memories, you enjoyed decaying them, all you want is decay more and more, you hunger for that destruction. Shigaraki glared angrily. I am no parasite. Yes you are, Tenko retorted, beginning to float into the air. This is my body, this is my mind. I am Tenko Shimura, not you. No, Shigaraki hissed. You're just an illusion. I was Tenko Shimura. I killed him and was reborn in the flames. Tenko fired his laser beams again. This time Shigaraki braced himself, forced back a few meters. If you were Tenko Shimura, then our sister, what was her name? Tenko demanded. Such a simple question, it was. Izuku glanced up, seeing for the first time there was uncertainty in Shigaraki's eyes. It was, it was. Hana, Tenko stated. Her name was Hana and if you were really me, then you would never even consider working for the monster that killed her. Tenko rocketed forwards, slamming his fist into Shigaraki before flying forwards to grab him before he could hit the ground. Twisting in midair, Tenko spun to build up speed and slammed Shigaraki down into the ground. 
Silence fell for a few seconds before Shigaraki began to chuckle. I know what this is, I understand what's going on. Shigaraki began to stand. A test from Sensei, to see if I'm truly loyal. I will not be fooled. I forgot her name because I didn't care to remember it. Anger etched itself deeper into Tenko's face. I know because I was the one who killed her, I decayed her and the others, and I'd do it again with no hesitation. Shigaraki straightened himself up. So go ahead, try your paltry tricks, I'll defeat this boss with no continues. Smirking, Shigaraki activated Blur and raced at Tenko, placing his hand on his chest before he could react. Nothing happened. Shigaraki removed his hand and placed it back down, yet still Decay did nothing. What? Tenko reared his fist back and punched Shigaraki, sending him spinning away. My quirk, my true quirk. Flight allows me to create an aerodynamic barrier around my body. You can't decay air. With a crash like thunder, Tenko flew forwards, ramming Shigaraki and gripping him around the waist. No, no, my true quirk is decay. Shigaraki yelled, trying and failing to break free. Correct. Tenko spoke as he stopped his ascent, twisting in the air so Shigaraki was aimed downwards. And you are not me. With a yell, Tenko activated flight and shot towards the ground, gaining speed with every passing second. You were not me those eleven years all for one honed me into a child soldier. You were not me when he murdered my family. You're just a parasite, feeding on my anger, my hatred. The ground began to near, Shigaraki's expression finally betraying the fear he felt. I am Tenko Shimura, and you will control me no longer. An explosion of white light radiated out from the point of impact, momentarily blinding Izuku as he continued to modify two becomes one. Tenko shook his head, standing and turning to face the beaten Shigaraki. I am Tenko Shimura, I have to be Tenko Shimura. Shigaraki intonted hurriedly, his form glitching. Tenko backed away. What's happening, Shigaraki? He's like a computer, he can't handle information he can't process. Izuku explained. Just a few more seconds, I'll be done, hopefully before he goes. Shigaraki tilted his head back and screamed. Hands made from dark energy erupting from his chest, setting their sights on Izuku and Tenko. I guess this will have to do. Izuku muttered hurriedly as the hands bared down on them. Izuku let go of the quirk. The quirk space around Izuku vanished in a swirl of color as he found himself being ejected from Shigaraki's body at high speed, his back slamming against a tree trunk. I think my bruises have bruises. Izuku groaned as he clambered to his feet, flexing his back and wincing as he did. Staggering forwards, Izuku came across Shigaraki, led on his back with his eyes staring unblinkingly, a quiet, continuous whine issuing from his lips. Midoriya. Passing Shigaraki, Izuku put one foot in front of the other, trying to stay upright. A rock in his path, tripping him and sending him crashing to the ground. Or it should have. Hands caught him, stopping his fall. Izuku felt three quirks blossom into existence within him, flight, laser and blur. It's okay, I'm here. Tenko smiled, slinging Izuku's arm over his shoulder. Izuku returned the smile. Thank you, cousin. Together the two teens limped their way in the direction of civilization and relative silence as a mountain road became visible through the tree. So, any more surprise relatives I need to know about? Tenko queried as they passed the tree line, finding themselves on the verge of the empty road. All for one is my father, well, his clone is. Izuku answered as Tenko helped him sit against a tree trunk. And then there's Makumo, pretty sure he's my half-brother, on the paternal side. And Maita, the children of all for one, obviously. And there's also, I get the idea. Tenko interrupted, before the two of them burst out laughing at the absurdity of the situation. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? Izuku choked out through laughter. Tenko couldn't respond, dissolving into fits of giggles every time he came close to calming down. Do you know what I just realized? Tenko finally managed to speak through gasps. I have super strength and can fly. I could have flown us here. The observation sent them both spiraling back into howls of laughter, the relief of having escaped their respective imprisonments heightening the humor of the situation. Headlights flashed onto the two of them, sobering them up as they watched a car drive up the mountain road towards them. The car stopped, and then so did the engine, taking the blinding headlights with it. A car door opened, on the driver's side. Izuku frowned. Hello. Closing the car door, Hisashi Midoriya walked to the front of the car, unchanged in the six years since Izuku had last seen him, except for a few more gray hairs at his temples. Need a lift. You're alive. Hisashi Midoriya nodded, his eyes not leaving the road in front of them. At least I was last time I checked. You're alive. Izuku repeated, sitting in the passenger seat of his father's car as they drove south down National Route 5. Really alive, not some kind of trick. A clone, all for one. A zombie. Yes, again, yes, not that I'm aware of. Not a clone, definitely not and absolutely when I haven't had my morning coffee. A clone never thinks they're a clone. Izuku argued. Plus, an imposter would claim they weren't an imposter. I'm not an imposter, trust me. Asashi assured. I can prove it. 
The time you drank yourself sick on All Might Cherry Cola because the advert claimed every can contained a sliver of All Might's power. Or the time I took you and Katsuki to the aquarium, I bought both of you a plushy dolphin. Katsuki threatened to blow his toy up because it was too cute to see for his image. But he never actually did. I remember those events very differently. Izuku replied. Oh, right, the memory block. I have to release that next time we stop. Hisashi realized. How about your sixth birthday party? Everything was All Might themed. Plates, cups, napkins, the cake, the tablecloths. The All Might impersonator you and mom hired. Izuku queried. Oh we hired one. Except the idiot turned up drunk on the day. Hisashi grumbled. Izuku frowned. I don't remember him being drunk. That's because he wasn't the one playing All Might in the end. Hisashi admitted. We were going to tell you kids All Might was busy stopping a villain and couldn't come. But you'd been so excited about it for weeks so I decided to do it myself. You were the All Might. Hisashi nodded. I hope his costume is made of better materials than that one was. I had a rash for weeks because of it. Izuku couldn't help but chuckle at the thought of the heart attack all for one would likely have if he learned his clone had dressed up as his most hated enemy. A somewhat awkward silence fell over the car. I have so many questions, I don't know where to start. Izuku admitted. I do too. But they're mostly just if I'm on hardcore hallucinogenics right now. Tenko added from the back seat. I have a cousin, an aunt and an uncle I never knew about. I'm free of Tamura and I now have three quirks. No, all of that's correct. Asashi reassured. Where have you been? Izuku questioned, dimly aware that it came out with a bit more force than he'd been expecting. Hiding mostly, Brazil, then Bolivia. Then one of all for one's goons found me so I bailed to a different continent. Went to Australia, in the outback, a remote quirk town. Asashi answered. And then I saw on the news that they were reporting your death so I booked the first flight back to Japan. I'm sorry if I scared you. I knew you weren't dead. Hisashi explained. One of my quirks. Tenko frowned. Did you just say one of my quirks? Allows me to tag up to five people at once. I get their general condition and a vague sense of what direction they're in. I've got Izuku tagged so it's how I tracked you two down. Hisashi continued. And yes, I said one of my quirks. I copied this one off a rather friendly man I met in India in. Well, it must have been 2107, maybe 2108, I think. You copied his quirk. Izuku asked, sitting up straighter in his seat. Not took his quirk. Took his quirk. Asashi repeated back. Why would I have taken his quirk? Because that's her quirk. The ability to give and take quirks. Izuku responded. The same quirk is all for one, you know, the guy you are cloned from. Cloned from. Asashi glanced over at his son. And not all for one's clone. Izuku, I am his brother. Izuku felt his mind crash and burn, trying to process what he'd just been told. What? How? Izuku managed to stutter out. All for one said that. You expect that Kaishi told you the truth? Asashi questioned. Kaishi is my twin brother, not a clone or a genetic template, my very annoying brother. Hell, he's probably confused about your origins as well. As far as he knows, I died nearly a hundred years ago. But Nana told me about how you worked with her and her predecessor, that you regretted being the merchant of quirks. Izuku argued, and all of that is true. Asashi admitted, Kaishi and I were both the merchant of quirks. In case the government managed to kill one of us, the other could continue. So you have all for one as well then? Tenko chimed in. I do. But it's not the quirk I was born with. And it's also not the quirk Kaishi was born with either. Asashi answered. My parents, they had what is now called a quirk marriage. My father had the power to decay anything he could touch. My mother had the power to copy the powers of others. They wanted to produce a child that could do both. Izuku murmured. Pretty much, specifically, a child that copy and then decay the quirk of their target. Asashi continued. They wanted to rule over each of the quirk bloodlines. If one got out of line, they would be cast out of Olympus, back to the rest of the mortals. Tenko frowned. Mortals, is that what they called the quirkless back then? Hisashi nodded. It was, and those who had the gift, were called champions. My parents' plan fell apart when Kaishi and I were born. Neither possessing the power they desired, my brother inherited decay and I had. Quirksmith. Izuku realized. We have the same quirk. We do. Hisashi smiled. It was called Quirksmith back then, for obvious reasons. As you know, Quirksmith can denature other quirks. I never found that out until decades later. Hisashi chuckled. It's ironic. My parents sought to control the other 29 bloodlines. And when Kaishi and I were deemed failures, they decided to have another child. Yoichi, whose quirk made those bloodlines obsolete. They made themselves obsolete. If Kaishi was born with decay, then how did he get all for one? Izuku queried. My parents, Kaishi, myself, after prolonged exposure to Yoichi's power, we all manifested secondary quirks. Asashi broke off for a second as he concentrated on overtaking the car in front. Kaishi got all for one. My father got a shark body quirk and my mother got a quirk that let her ingest anything. And you. I thought I hadn't got one at first. Until I was 21. Asashi sighed. 
Some guys on my university course caught wind of the fact I had a meta ability and jumped me in an alley. I bled to death alone that night. And then the next morning I woke up naked on the shore of Lake Kawagachiko, alive and well. Some kind of resurrection quirk. That's not the best description. Asashi glanced across at his son. When we look at the ocean, we see that each wave has a beginning and an end. That's what it's like. My wave washes back to the ocean and then returns once again. I'm made of different water, not exactly the same as I was before. Asashi paused. Sometimes it feels like I truly die and some other man with the same face walks away. Izuku bowed his head. Is that why you left? Because you died. Changed. No, I haven't died in the best part of 30 years. Asashi answered. Besides, no matter how many times I revive, I'll always love you, Izuku. Tenko shuffled awkwardly in the back seat, feeling as if he was intruding on a very personal moment. How many times have you died? Six times now. Every time I come back at the same age I was the first time, 21. Hisashi explained. Every time I revive, the time between my death and return gets longer. The last time I died I didn't come back for nine years. Really confused those poor French tourists. The process is kind of weird. You always come back at Lake Kawagachiko. Hisashi bobbed his head. Every time, exact same place. It's funny, I used to live in Orashi, not far from the lake. Used to go there with my brothers all the time when I was a kid. Izuku looked up, about to reply, only to catch sight of a purple portal forming on the road ahead of them. Dad, look out. Hisashi slammed on the brakes, managing to stop just short of the portal. All for one strode out of the portal, followed by the woman Izuku had seen him talking to earlier, Atsurobata. After them was a hulking blonde man, one of his eyes missing, a vicious scar split by his cybernetic replacement, muscular, the villain that killed water hose, and then came the final figure. That's not good. Izuku sighed. Izuku's original body stepped through the portal, dressed in his costume beta. Tenko leaned forwards between the front seats. That's not you in there as well, is it? No, Izuku answered. I don't think it is. I was worried you'd say that. Whoever was in Izuku's original body turned their head, revealing stained black hair and glowing red eyes. Straightening his suit, all for one chuckled. Hello, brother. 24 hours earlier, Katsuki hesitated at the door. He'd been arguing for weeks to be allowed in for a visit. In the end he managed to convince Hound Dog it was necessary for his therapy. Now he was actually here. Katsuki was terrified to cross the threshold. Not that he would ever admit that. Taking a deep breath, Katsuki opened the door with uncharacteristic carefulness and stepped inside. Lying on the hospital bed was Izuku. A section of his green hair had been shaved for surgery and was now clearly starting to grow back. The stump that was all that remained of his left arm was bandaged up. The missing finger on his right hand had managed to slowly grow back before his healing quirks had determined that it was no longer a recent injury. Deku, he didn't stir. Katsuki moved forwards, adjusting his UA uniform subconsciously, standing over Izuku's unconscious form. He knew what he needed to say, he'd already written it, with Hound Dog's help. The truth is I never hated you because you were quirkless, or that I thought you had all for one. Katsuki paused. I hated you because you are better than me, you always were. The breath caught in Katsuki's throat. Even back then, with no quirk, you were my hero. Katsuki continued. Even when I demeaned you and put you down, you held out your hand to me when I fell. Slowly, Katsuki stretched out his arm, his palm out towards Izuku. You look like you need saving. Katsuki smiled, for what felt like the first time in years. That's what my hero name is, a promise, to reach out my hand to those who've fallen. Katsuki wished Izuku would reach out and take his hand. He wished the nerd would call him that stupid, childish nickname, just one more time. That's what you taught me, Izuku Midoriya. Katsuki reached down, grasping Izuku's limp hand. Now, wake up. Fingers tightened around Katsuki's hand. Izuku gasped as he sat bolt upright, turning his head to look Katsuki in the eyes. You're not a god, you're just a pale copy, the real all for one isn't here. Izuku spoke with an echoed voice, like two voices speaking at once. This ends here, overhaul. What the fuck? Katsuki hissed, pulling his hand free and hitting the emergency call button. Here he is in the dungeons, I promised I'd save her. Katsuki backed away, before dropping into a combat stance, blood dripping from where Izuku's grip had broken his skin. Quirksmith hero, Hinode. Izuku paused, before smiling. Are you ready to go? Because from now on, you write your own future. The door slammed open, allowing a doctor and three nurses to enter, all of them immediately moving to restrain the now thrashing Izuku. Thank you, Uri. The lights began to flash, electricity crackling over Izuku's skin. I've decided I'll be the hero who saves everybody. The heart rate monitor was sounding faster and faster, as Izuku continued to jerk wildly. That body doesn't belong to you. Raising his head, Izuku took a deep breath and released a gout of fire at the ceiling. One of the nurses swore, looking around. Kid, get the fire extinguisher. Katsuki stood dumbly for a second before bursting into motion, grabbing the fire extinguisher from the wall and spraying it on the burning ceiling. 
Izuku's arm turned to diamond, flailing it wildly, knocking the doctor and one of the nurses back into the wall. The door slammed open again, admitting four security guards, quickly adding their strength to the attempts to restrain Izuku. Eraser head, we need eraser head, the doctor yelled, cradling her clearly now broken arm. Watanabe, go get him. The nurse who'd also been slammed into the wall stumbled to his feet and nodded, running out into the corridor. It's okay Eri, I'll be here for you for as long as you want me. Katsuki wasn't sure how long he stood there, watching Izuku thrash wildly. It could have been a few seconds, or hours. The door slammed open, revealing a racer head. Behind him stood All Might, muscles straining against his yellow suit, and Auntie and Ko, young Midoriya. All Might cried out, Izuku, please, no, no, no. Auntie and Ko rushed forwards, grasping at her son. Mom, eyes shone red, erasure activated and focused directly on Izuku. Izuku stilled, a smile quirking on his lips. Home, the long way round. The green-haired teen collapsed back into his bed, the heart rate monitor emitting a single, continuous tone. He's gone into cardiac arrest. The doctor called. Ms. Midoriya, please stand back. Please, Izuku, you can't die. Someone get recovery girl. Katsuki sat against the wall of the corridor, a nurse bandaging his injured hand. Footsteps pounded on linoleum before skidding to a halt. What happened? Yeorazu questioned desperately. Ada and Todoroki next to her, both looking equally impatient. The damn nerd woke up. Katsuki spoke, his voice hollow, standing and placing himself in the way of the door. That's good, isn't it? Todoroki spoke. Is he awake? Can we see him? Katsuki refused to meet the eyes of any of them. He had some kind of fit, a brain hemorrhage. The three teens pushed past Katsuki into the hospital room. In the bed laid Izuku, a tube once again breathing for him. Katsuki shuffled into the room, unable to move his eyes away from the figure on the bed. No, Ada barked, striding forwards and gripping Izuku's hand. He was getting better, he was nearly healed. There was no reaction. No, Yeorazu uttered, her voice breaking as she stifled tears. Ada bowed his head, sobs silently racking his body. How? The door closed, All Might's massive hand dwarfing the doorknob. Recovery girl and other medical staff were able to resuscitate Midoriya, but the damage to his brain was severe. Medzu explained, hopping down from All Might's shoulder. But he could heal it, could he not? Todoroki queried, head bowed, silent tears streaming down his face, like he did before. Yes, but his quirks, they're vanishing. All Might spoke, his voice hollow. Recovery girl's tests have confirmed it, ten of them so far. We don't know how long before his regeneration quirks are gone, they could be next, or the very last. All four teens looked at their teachers with surprise. Even Katsuki hadn't known that. How? All for one couldn't have just swanned in here and taken them with no one noticing. Katsuki growled. How is he losing quirks without that bastard taking them? We don't know how. All Might answered. We're keeping the life support on for the time being. Hoping for a miracle, just in case one for all has one last trick up its sleeve. I hate lying to them like that. Tashinori spoke, relaxing into his natural form as soon as the elevator doors closed. I am very aware. Nedzu replied, pressing the button for his office. This is the 34th time you have voiced your displeasure at this plan. They think Izuku is going to die. Tashinori argued. They're just kids. And that is exactly why they cannot know. Nedzu answered. It is our duty to safeguard them. If they knew that Midoriya's consciousness had transferred to the clone they would stop at nothing to rescue him. That doesn't mean I have to like it. Tashinori grumbled, triggering one for all as the elevator doors opened to reveal Nedzu's office. You want me to hack into the HPSC communication network and shut it down? Nedzu and All Might took their seats at the conference table, next to Aizawa and Yamada, both looking across at a confused Mei Hatsum. We do, Ms. Hatsum. Nedzu spoke, and as I'm sure you can surmise, this is a matter of utmost secrecy. Many lives rest upon the cutting of the villain's communication lines, and you're not sure how deep his fingers go, so take it all out. Hatsum surmised. I take it that the HPSC isn't aware of this plan. No, the villain has half of those useless bureaucrats under his thumb. Aizawa muttered, just loud enough for the whole room to hear. And the other half are too incompetent to notice or even care. Good, I'll do it, and I have just the thing. Hatsum smirked, opening her laptop and navigating through her files. I've hacked into the HPSC before, like, six years ago. What I found was disgusting. You were the one who leaked that HPSC forced the UA Board of Directors to reject successful quirkless candidate. Yamada realized, leaning forward in his seat. Yep, but that was nothing compared to the other stuff I found. The projector whirred into life, mirroring Hatsum's screen onto the wall. Shit, All Might couldn't believe what he was seeing. Evidence that the HPSC was illegally surveilling the nation's communications, with specific focus on those with mutant quirks. How long? Aizawa questioned. As long as there's been a HPSC. Hatsum answered, 
even longer actually. Back when it was known as the Department for the Regulation of Powered Beings, I have long since suspected this was the case, but I've never been able to gather any evidence. Nedzu spoke, looking at Hatsum with unveiled delight. How? They never expected a ten-year-old on a school trip to sneak a backdoor into their system when no one was looking. Ah, uh, they always watch me like a hawk when I visit, never let me get too close to any technology. Nedzu smirked. But a young child, they arrogantly assumed you wouldn't have the skill. Aizawa frowned. Why not release this with the other information you leaked? I was going to. Hatsum answered. But after I leaked the first batch they got closer than I'd like to admit to my IP address. I couldn't risk being banned from going to UA. How else was I going to make all my amazing babies? Nedzu hummed, before looking to his right. All Might, how do you feel about the leak coming from within Might Tower? All Might went to speak, but hesitated. You're the only one of us with the clout and public adoration that makes you effectively untouchable to the HPSC. Yamada urged. I can back you up on my radio show, the public love me too. Fine, the leak can come from within Might Tower, but only from my terminal, my login, the buck stops with me. All Might nodded resolutely. Aizawa rolled his eyes. So, Hatsum is in charge of severing the HPSC lines of communication. I'll leak the dirt from All Might's office. Nedzu summarized, pausing for any interjections or comments. None came. Excellent. The raid is due to commence at 900 hours the day after next. Nedzu continued. That means we need to start this prong of attack at around 830 hours, to give time for a little chaos to build before we strike the target. A scent came from around the table. Nedzu smirked, rubbing his paws together. It's time for the HPSC to pay for the pain they inflicted upon me and my brethren. The next morning, Katsuki noticed the atmosphere in the common area as soon as he set foot in it. Cautiously excited, what's getting the extras all happy? Katsuki questioned, joining Todoroki at the breakfast bar, looking at the rest of his classmates in the common area. Ada and Yeyorazu chose that moment to exit the lift, making their way towards the common area, both still clearly reeling from what happened last night. Asui and Jiro believe they have found Minta's location. Todoroki answered, so that's why it isn't as depressing as usual in here. Katsuki commented, so, where do they think he is? Yokohama. Sue found an image of Minta's mother hosting a benefit gala last month and was able to identify Minta in the background. Yuraraka explained as she joined the other two. Jiro used the metadata in the image to find the coordinates where it was taken. The metadata. Shouldn't whatever social platform stripped the EXIF data from the image when it was uploaded? Katsuki frowned. Jiro spoke up from the common area. Any half-decent social media site, like Kokoro3 or Chirp, does that. On the other hand, Henasu, the far-right total free speech platform she posted it on, does not. So let's just go rescue him, right? Siro shrugged. Siro, you cannot propose that we leave Yue and trespass upon a private residence. Ida barked, chopping his arm. I believe that is exactly what Siro is suggesting. Todoroki commented. I'm in. Todoroki. Ida chastised. Todoroki shrugged. It's what Midoriya would do. And it's what he would convince us all to do as well. The room made noises of agreement. Katsuki could even see a few of them starting to get up. We aren't heroes, not yet, and if we do this then we never will be. Ida stated. Murmurs of discontent echoed around the room. Is this where you want your hero journey to end? Ida demanded, eyes blazing. Because not one of you thought we should informing Mr. Aizawa, or one of the other teachers. They're the ones who let Minta's mother take him out of Yue. Kaminari shouted, jumping out of seat. How the hell can we trust that they'll do anything now? They did nothing to rescue Midoriya. And look what happened to him. More than a few of Katsuki's classmates flinched. Deku's supposed death was still raw for them. And now he was going to die again. Explosions popped. Katsuki barely realized what he'd done before he surged forwards. Those fucks did everything they could to save Deku. Katsuki yelled. In fact, they're probably ten bloody steps ahead of us on this. So if we going charging and guns fucking akimbo we would just screw everything up. The wind left Kaminari's sails, the teen dropping back into his seat. We can't just do nothing. We take this to Mr. Aizawa. Yeyorazu stated, Just like Ida said we should, as acting class president I will take it. Sue, Jiro, you can come with me. I should come too. Ada stated, his voice resolute, but his expression betrayed indecisiveness. No. Yeyorazu placed a hand on Ada's shoulder. Today's the day your brother gets discharged from hospital, you should be there. I can handle this. Ada hesitated, before nodding. I will go see my brother, thank you, Yeyorazu. Katsuki didn't bother to stick around to see any more sopiness, slipping out of the dorms whilst no one was looking and heading towards the main building. Entering the Heroics Tower, Katsuki stopped in the doorway of the Hall of Remembrance, staring at the nerd's costume on display. Katsuki clenched his fists, resisting the urge to charge in and explode the stupid mass of fabric. You were supposed to wake up, Deku. Back you go. Katsuki growled, less than pleased by the interruption. 
What? The blonde-haired teen snapped as he wheeled around to see Akatani jogging towards him. The support student came to halt, holding out a small case. Here, Katsuki scrunched his face up. What is it? It's to say thank you for testing those prototype repulsor upgrades, Akatani explained, before stifling a yawn. Heavy bags under his eyes. I think the first few designs would have shattered my wrists if I'd tried to use them. Thank you Araka, she's the one who nagged me into it, Katsuki retorted, taking the case and opening it. Inside were two silver metal bracelets, each modeled after the top of a grenade, just missing the lever. What are they? Katsuki barked. Put them on, then do this, Akatani instructed, before forming a cross with his forearms and tapping his wrists together three times. Katsuki shot the support student a disbelieving look, but did as he was told. As soon as Katsuki's wrists touched a third time the bracelets expanded, forming massively slimmed down versions of his gauntlets, smooth green metal flush over the outside of his forearms, the levers running most of the way to his elbow. On the inside of each was a cylindrical tank to store his sweat, again covered by green metal. The tanks can store about 90% of what your old gauntlets could, but they are removable, so you can store them for later and swap them in when you want. Akatani detailed. Also, if you twist the lever the gauntlet will release the gaseous nitroglycerin without igniting it. Katsuki grunted in acknowledgement. The gloves were largely the same, except with segmented green armor over the backs of his hands and down his fingers. Clench your fists and squeeze twice. Again, Katsuki did as he was told, this time with less hesitation. The levers suddenly retracted in sharp, orange and black fins protruded from his gauntlets. Three rows on the outside of his forearms, two on the back of his hands and one down each of his fingers. What you can explode, you can rip to shreds, Akatani explained. You can squeeze twice again to retract them. Same for collapsing them back into the bracelets. Tap your wrist together three times. They're not total garbage, emo hair, Katsuki admitted, retracting them back into bracelet form. Akatani beamed with pride. Hatsum had the idea for the razor fins. I'm already working on an upgrade that can redirect your explosions to boost your punching power. Katsuki grunted in thanks, testing the weight of the bracelets on his wrists. I've put in a support notice to have them added to your hero costume, but those ones won't be collapsible. Akatani added, officially, these ones don't exist, but if we're going to stop all for one, we may not always have our costumes. Don't worry, I won't snitch. Katsuki grunted, before turning and walking away, round two corners and towards the service elevator. Punching in the code he'd been given by All Might, the door slid open. Katsuki paused. I know you're fucking following me, half and half. Todoroki came to a halt at Katsuki's side. I wasn't attempting to be subtle. Sure you weren't. Katsuki snorted, stepping into the lift and pressing the lowest button. Todoroki didn't respond, maintaining his normal stoic expression as he joined Katsuki. The doors closed, the lift starting its descent in basement levels that didn't officially exist. I didn't expect you to be in support of going to Aizawa, and I didn't expect you to go all. Katsuki paused. Deku, you say that like it's a bad thing. Todoroki replied, his tone even. Katsuki shot his classmate with a withering glare. We're going to see the moron in hospital. He lost an arm, his quirks and the world thinks he's dead. The lift came to a halt, the doors opening. Point noted. Todoroki spoke, stepping into the corridor and heading in the direction of Izuku's room. Fuck you. Katsuki snapped back, pushing past Todoroki and marching towards his destination. Kicking the door open, Katsuki's shoulders dropped at the sight of Izuku, still in a coma, hooked up to machines and monitors. Were you expecting a miracle? Todoroki asked, passing Katsuki and taking a seat at Izuku's side. Those only exist in stories. You're a ray of fucking sunshine. Katsuki groused, closing the door and moving towards the seat opposite Todoroki. A knock at the door. Are you going to get that? Todoroki questioned. Katsuki dropped into the chair, putting his feet up on the side of the bed. Nope. Todoroki sighed, before standing and making his way to the door. The person outside knocked again. That will not make me go any faster. Todoroki rolled his eyes at their impatience and opened the door. Akatani stood in the doorway, his eyes staring directly ahead, completely unfocused. Shit, the nerd's brother followed us. Katsuki yelled angrily. Eraserhead's gonna be pissed. Todoroki frowned. You are not Makumo Akatani. Akatani suddenly smirked. You're half right, call me Ikigata. With a flash of light, Akatani split in two, one remained standing, red eyes glowing, the other collapsed to the floor unconscious. Ikigata stepped inside the room. You led me exactly where I wanted you to. Hello again, Izuku. Don't you dare touch him. Katsuki snarled, jumping to his feet, explosions already crackling around his palms. Todoroki dropped into a fighting stance. You were the one who took him, you were possessing Akatani all this time. Three miserable years, give or take a few short jaunts and a few other bodies. But that's over now, I will get a better body, one that will be all my own. Ikigata snarled, and it all starts with taking this one. 
Katsuki and Todoroki followed Ikigata's line of sight to where Izuku lay. You will not take Midoriya. Todoroki spoke, his tone frosty. Ikigata stared at them for a few seconds, before bursting into mocking laughter. You don't know, do you? Fucking tell us before I blow you sky high. No need to get so riled up, Bakugo. Ikigata mocked. That body is empty. Izuku is long gone. Tricked into moving his consciousness into a cloned body, this body is just ripe for the picking. With a roar, Katsuki ignited his palms and blasted towards Ikigata. Pathetic. Ikigata sneered, his eyes flashing a deeper red, his hair floating upwards. Katsuki's quirk was erased, but he still had his momentum, aiming a kick at his opponent. Ikigata didn't bother moving, allowing the blow to hit him and bounce off, Katsuki hitting the floor and rolling. Todoroki stamped his foot, creating a wave of ice that utterly encased Ikigata, leaving no part of him visible. Katsuki hissed as he put weight on his injured leg. How the fuck does that prick have a razor's quirk? That name, Ikigata, he is a child of all for one. Todoroki stated. The ice began to melt, revealing Ikigata, breathing great plumes of fire from his mouth. So you know of me. Ikigata mused. Not too surprising, the Todorokis were one of the original families. Original families? Todoroki questioned. You are ignorant of your own history. Ikigata taunted. Your family has had quirks since before the dawn of Quirked Era. No wonder you're all so strong. Katsuki looked between Ikigata and Izuku. Isahat, keep him busy. Gladly, Todoroki stamped his foot again, a giant fist of ice slamming into Ikigata and sending him crashing through the wall. Katsuki moved over to the side of Izuku's bed, reared his hand back and slapped him across the face. Wake the fuck up, you stupid moron. Katsuki growled, grabbing Izuku by his gown. Wake up. Izuku's head lolled to one side, pressing against the bed rails. I said wake up, you useless fuck. There was still no response. Damn it. Katsuki yelled. What kind of hero are you if you just lie here sleeping when you're needed? Katsuki went to slap Izuku again. A hand lashed out, grabbing Katsuki's wrist before he could make contact. Ikigata's eyes glowed red, cancelling Todoroki's quirk before the ice could fully form. Raising a hand, Ikigata turned his fingers into sharpened metal talons. You are not needed. Ikigata stared, and you're just getting in the way. Ikigata charged at Todoroki, talons ready to slice him to ribbons. An entire hospital bed sailed through the hole in the wall, hitting Ikigata and knocking him onto the floor, the bed on top of him. Izuku Midoriya stepped through the broken wall, his eyes boring into Ikigata. You, you're the one who kidnapped me. Izuku stated. You will regret that. Ikigata heaved the bed off himself. That's not possible. That body was empty. Izuku Midoriya is in a clone body. I am the Izuku Midoriya. Not a vestige, not a clone, the definite article, you might say. Izuku raised his arm, falling into a fighting stance and clenching his fist. Red lines crisscrossed his body, before fading away and being replaced by green electricity crackling around him. One for all, full cowling. Badai Mansion Raid Arc. Okay sadly the chapter is over. And if you enjoyed the video just leave a like, and subscribe with post notification. So when the next chapter is ready, you will be notified. Okay see you in the next video. Bye.